Okay, it looks like we are now live. I'd like to welcome everybody to this regularly scheduled meeting of the City of Crescent City Council. My name is Mayor Jason Greeno, and it is 6.04. We're a little late tonight, uh, June 21st, 2021. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Altman? Here. Council Member Smith? Here. Council Member Wright? Here. Mayor Pro Tem and Score? I'm here. And Mayor Greeno? I am here. Thank you. At this time, let's uh, uh, all stand and pledge allegiance to our flag, this great country that we live in. Ready and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We did have closed session today. Uh, and so did we have anything to report out from closed session? No actions to report this evening, Mayor. All right, thank you. Moving forward, we're going to move on to public comment. Uh, any member of the audience is invited to address the city council on any matter that is within the jurisdiction of the city of Crescent City. Comments of public interest or on matters appearing on the agenda are accepted. Note, however, that the council is not able to undertake extended discussion or act on non-agendized items. Such items can be referred to, the, to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on a future agenda. All comments shall be directed towards the entire council. Any comment that is not at the microphone will be out of order and will be not be part of the public record. After re receiving recognition from the mayor, please state your name and city or county residency for the record. Public comment is limited to three minutes. The public is additionally allotted three minutes for, minutes for each agendized item. And there are a couple different ways that you can submit your public comment. If you'd like to email it to us, you can email us at publiccomment at crescentcity.org. Or if you'd like to phone in your public comment, you can just call us at 253-215-8782 with the webinar ID of, oh, we lost, I lost my screen, sorry. The webinar ID is 865-3454-1165. Or if you'd like to uh, just raise your hand if you're here with us on Zoom, that's another way that you can submit your public comment. Do we have any public comment at this time? Mayor Greeno, I did not see any hands raised from our Zoom audience. And I've not received any emails. All right, thank you. Moving on to our ceremonial items, we have a proclamation in recognition of uh, our health care workers and their conduct throughout the pandemic. And I will read that right now. Whereas in February 2020, COVID-19 pandemic became a reality in the United States, the staff of the Del Norte County Public Health, as well as community partners and members rose to the challenge to ensure the health, well-being and safety of the citizens of Crescent City. And whereas to combat the global pandemic, staff continued to show up for work even in the face of a dangerous threat for the betterment of their fellow citizens. And whereas the compassion shown during the challenge of the unimaginable pandemic, as well as the courage, dedication and leadership have been essential to Crescent City community. And whereas while many of us were being told to stay home, these workers had a responsibility during the outbreak to continue operations, uh, potentially putting their lives in danger. And whereas these healthcare officials at all levels of staffing have proven during the, the 
COVID-19 health pandemic to be more than just essential workers, but frontline heroes uh, for all Delnert County. And whereas Delnert County community volunteers have donated countless hours to distribute personal protective equipment and in coordination with the public health staff vaccination clinics to assist in protecting the community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Crescent City honor all those uh, unsung heroes of our community during this pandemic and especially commend the public health officer, Dr. Warren Raywalt, MD, public health program director, Melody Cannon Cutts, public health nurses, Shelby Bodenstab, Jamie Groomley, uh, Colleen uh, Machado, uh, Elizabeth Hassman, Rose uh, Hepburn, and Carrie Ventry, and the volunteer coordinator Deborah Wakefield for their unwavering dedication to the citizens of Delmar County. So thank you, thank you all for all of your hard work uh, and dedication through this. And do we have uh, anyone here who would like to speak and accept this proclamation? Uh, we do, Mayor Grina. We're joined by the program director, Melody Cannon Cuts, the uh, the uh, lead uh, public health nurse, uh, Shelby Bodenstab, and the uh, soon to be uh, retiring Dr. Warren Raywalt. Uh, uh, I believe all three are, are here with us tonight. All right. Uh, I'm gonna say that I think Melody and Shelby should accept this because I, I've spoken to this group plenty of times already. <laughs> and I think the, the heaviest step, the biggest part of the honor goes to them. All right, well, I'll open the floor to either Melody or Shelby at this time then, if they would like to speak. Melody, you're muted. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you tonight, Mayor and Council members, and we appreciate so much this honor that you're, you're giving to us. Um, I Just a little bit of news, you know, I accepted the program manager position almost 14 years ago to the day and my very first week on the job, the third day, I was in an emergency preparedness tabletop exercise. And we have trained over time in many different capacities and many different scenarios, pandemic being something that we were you know, looking at that we really haven't gone through this, nor has any community in many, many years. And so I am so grateful for the, the fact that COVID-19 did not impact our community more than it did. I'm also very grateful for the team that we had to address this challenge at the time. And I, I thank you and I, I want to just say that I am a very appreciative of my team and Dr. Ray Walt for the effort and the dedication they provided to our community. All right, thank you. I'll go ahead and I'll jump in and say, um, Thank you all for this. Um, it's really, we really appreciate it. This year, I think we can all agree, has been a very long year. <laughs> and we're very grateful to be uh, this far through the pandemic. Um, everything that we've been able to accomplish during this pandemic has been because of our community. We have such an amazing community that really, you know, wrapped uh, around itself um, to protect our, you know, our community from everything that was going on outside of it. So thank you to, you know, everybody who actually made all of this possible. We, there's, there's no way we could do it alone. All right. Thank you both for being here. And we thank you for your continued service to our community. And, and Mayor, if I could just say just, just a couple of words from, you know, from a UC uh, director standpoint, being involved in this and, and having just the, the true privilege of working with Melody and Shelby and Dr. Raywald through it was an absolute you know, let's just be honest with this. This whole thing was an absolute nightmare. I mean, for what it did to as a community, to the restrictions, to the businesses, to, you know, just the fact that the, the stress level of trying to deal with it on a day in day out basis and the way that they've conducted themselves through the pandemic with all the changing restrictions from the state and having to try to move and work with businesses has truly been remarkable. 
Uh, Melody has done a great job. She's worked with the with our task force, the Economic uh, Resiliency Task Force with Holly Went. She's there on a weekly basis talking to us and helping businesses through what this means from a health perspective and helping them try to persevere. Shelby's been a, a rock star in regard to, to public health and trying to help us decipher some of these things. And then just being there when we needed some advice from even a city employee standpoint, she has helped us through a tremendous amount of scenarios. Dr. Raywald uh, has, has been a, a true inspiration. Uh, I think he has talked a little bit in the past about the fact that he didn't, when he took this job, he thought it was going to be uh, just a part-time job that he could help the community out for a couple of years and then it or maybe a year or something like that. It was a short time period. Right after he took the job, the pandemic broke out. And instead of working the, you know, the 10, 15, 20 hours a week, he thought it was more like 60, 70 hour weeks to try to persevere through this. And so just as a community, as a, as a community member, I guess, first, I'm very thankful to have this public health team to be able to work with them has been a, an absolute true honor. The other person that unfortunately couldn't be here tonight is Deborah Wakefield and her efforts in, in regard to coordinating the volunteers, standing up, you know, vaccination clinics like they did with this public health team and having the, uh, the ability to coordinate that seamlessly at first the airport and then the fairgrounds, tremendous efforts and one that there is no, there's no book for, you know, that's the other thing is that there's no script on exactly how to do this. It's kind of figure out how, how it goes and then adapt and modify and persevere. And, you know, and that's exactly what they've done. And so I just want to say just a sincere thank you to this group and, uh, and Dr. Ray Walt from, uh, from a city staff standpoint. Thank you, Eric. And, and thank you, Mayor and, and all the council members. Um, um, I'm just going to say a few words just on behalf of the rest of the department, you know, because we really do appreciate the support you've given us. And that's been a really rough year. It feels like it's finally wound down and things are headed back towards normal. So. We really appreciate the, the honor you gave us. All right. Thank you so much for being here. And we really appreciate your service to our community. All right. Moving on to our second ceremonial item. We have uh, Kevin Tupman, uh, who has retired. And uh, he is a 15-year veteran with the city. Um, Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Greenow, uh, members of the council. So we do have, uh, we have Mr. Tutman who is, uh, who is here with us tonight. Uh, and like you said, he's, he's been with the city for over 15 years now. Uh, and so I have had the, uh, the sincere honor of, of working with him for all of those years. I know we have Director Olson here, uh, here as well. And, uh, and John has been able to, to work with Kevin for the last, uh, for, for John's whole career with the city, which unbelievably now has progressed into, uh, into to multiple years already, time, time flies. Uh, and so John, definitely welcome you to turn on your video as well. And, and you can say a few words, you know, from, from my standpoint, a lot of the projects that, that we've been able to complete, Kevin has been there working a lot of times behind the scenes, but making a lot of those projects better than what they would have been if Kevin wasn't part of this team. Uh, Kevin worked, uh, the, one of his first big projects was the bridge, the, the Elk Creek pedestrian bridge. Many people don't know, but this it actually changed the complete alignment on that. And this was Kevin's thing. Kevin picked this up and, and brought it to our attention. So guys, this isn't gonna work very well. And so he helped redesign and reposition that bridge to, to a spot that it would work. Another big project that Kevin worked on was the RV park. Uh, Kevin, and let's, that's what he's doing now is my understanding is he's traveling around in an RV. He understood what would make a good RV park and some of those little nuances with pull throughs and back ends and where those utilities went. Kevin helped us redesign that before that project was complete. He worked tirelessly on, on the second street sewer project uh, to make that large project at the time, one of the biggest projects that we had ever taken on as, you know, especially internally uh, as a, as a city staff, obviously the treatment plant was a big one. Kevin was involved in that one as well. Progressed on to B Street and then, uh, and then Front Street's the most visible. But the, the other big one that he uh, absolutely played a key role in was the pool remodel in 2008. Uh, again, a project the city didn't have enough money in, so we had to take a lot of that design in-house. Kevin worked on the complete redesign of those locker rooms and the, the showers in the ADA room and, and whatnot. And he was kind of the, the man behind the scenes that, that made it all work. And so 
from my standpoint, Kevin, I just want to give you a sincere thank you, and it's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Director Olson. Thanks, Eric. Uh, you covered all the, a lot of the projects really well, so I'll focus on a different aspect. Uh, Kevin is a brain trust to the city uh, when it comes to historical knowledge, and uh, he's also a great photographer. So uh, those are a couple of the areas that the city will be less without Kevin uh, present. So uh, anyway, I've appreciated his, his understanding of uh, what's happened in the past and why things are the way they are. So um, it's something that will be a, a, a significant loss to the city. So. You know, I'll speak to, to one more just briefly, and that's uh, and that was Front Street. And I think it was 2009. We had a, we're having a city town hall meeting and didn't know what to do with this five lane road. And I think it was one of Kevin's ideas. Well, hey, why don't we break this down and create some parking? Right? And we had this early concept uh, of kind of what it was. It wasn't years polished as what it turned out to be. That took years of, of refinement. But, you know, a lot of that comes down with just the brainstorming, the creativity that, uh, that Mr. Tubman brought. So anyway, so from a, from a management standpoint, Kevin, a, a, a co-worker and a friend, thank you for all that you've, uh, you've done for the city and, uh, and you will be missed. Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate it. I, uh, it's, it's that bittersweet, you know. Um, I really did feel like a team member, you know, like the city was a family. And uh, I know you and I had a, a lot of time together and – so, uh, yeah, it, uh, I would say it's one of the most significant chapters in my life for personal development and, and what I've done. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. We'd just like to thank you for your time at the city and, and your service to our community. Um, you will be missed and we wish you uh, many blessings and many years to come. Uh, in retirement so thank you you're thank welcome you. all right you know typically we would have the, the the traditional city picture with the you know the the sunset and whatnot but but mr tubman said that that one wasn't for him so what what kevin and request was actually an old uh, an old street sign uh with the with the lighthouse that kevin had was a big part of and it's a it's the front street uh street sign and so that's what that's what Kevin had requested as as his uh, going away and a uh, and assigned uh, assigned version. So. Yeah, go up behind my shop bench in my garage, you know, where I will continue to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, and we wish you the best. Congratulations, Kevin. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. Thanks, yeah, Kevin. I, I, I'll be joining you soon. I've got my truck. I've got my trailer. I'm not far behind you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Would have liked to got 20 years out of you, but congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was aiming for that. I was aiming, but, uh, you know, just uh, other things happened that enabled me to get out in a different part of my life. Good for Enjoy. you. Enjoy. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right, moving on to our consent calendar. Uh, we have several items on here. Uh, we have our council meeting minutes. We have our warrant claims list, our payroll report, our economic development strategic action plan, uh, budget to actual financial report for May of 2021, the notice of completion for our Amador tank rehabilitation project, as well as our Sunset Circle Multi-Use Trail Project Notice of Completion. Make a motion to approve consent. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any public comment on our close, sorry, our consent calendar? I don't see any hands raised from our Zoom audience. And Mayor Greeno, uh, I do not have any email, but I would like to take just a second. I got an email from someone who said that they couldn't find the Zoom link on the county's website. They're watching via YouTube right now. 
So I'm going to ask, uh, I couldn't reach back to her because of the email that she sent it through, but you can find the Zoom link on the city's website and that's uh, crescentcity.org under upcoming meetings. All right. Thank you. With that, uh, please poll the vote. Council Member Altman? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem in score? Yes. And Mayor Greeno? Yes. Thank you. All right. Moving on in our agenda, we have uh, a couple public hearings here. Uh, the adoption of the Beach Fires regula Regulations Urgency Ordinance. We adopted the ordinance at our last meeting, but uh, unfortunately it will not be, it was not going to be in, uh, should I say, effect until after July 4th. And so we felt it was important that it, it be in effect for July 4th. And so this is, that is why we have this, this urgency ordinance here on our agenda. Yes, thank you, Mayor Green and members of the council. We do have City Attorney uh, Rice and our uh, Fire Chief Paul Gillespie with us to, to answer any questions. And I will ask uh, City Attorney Rice, since this is a public hearing, maybe just go through the bullet points of what this urgency ordinance is and what will be effective for the public. Uh, any questions the council might have, we can answer. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this ordinance before you tonight is identical to the ordinance that was adopted at the last council meeting. It includes some changes to the regulations of beach fires um, as to compared to what's currently in the city municipal code. Um, the ordinance contains the following significant provisions. It prohibits beach fires on the public beach between Preston Island, south to the Battery Point Vista area. It prohibits the building of fire upon private property without the written permission of the property owner. Also establishes regulations for all beach fires, including limiting the size and location that match the fire code. That means that a fuel area is limited to three feet in diameter and two feet high and must be located 25 feet from structures or, or vegetation. Also requires beach fires be fully extinguished prior to abandonment and expressly prohibits the burying of coals. This ordinance, if adopted this evening, would be effective immediately. In order to be adopted this evening, it must be, um, we need a four-fifths vote. Because it is an urgency ordinance, it requires a four-fifths vote. Um, the reason this is appropriate for urgency adoption um, is that we do have the big 4th of July celebration coming up. Um, there is um, a history of fires along that area. We've had extremely dry and windy conditions this year. So if we want these um, restrictions to, to be in place, which was the original intent of the council, um, then we would need to adopt an urgency ordinance tonight. All right, thank you. Do we have any uh, questions from the council for staff or comments? All right, do we have any public comment on this item? You have one hand raised, uh, Mayor. All right, looks like Natalie uh, Fawning is here, or Fanning. Uh, we should be on mute. It well, is Natalie Fawning. Thank you very much. Um, well. Yes, please adopt the ordinance tonight. And also, um, please put up permanent signage at 4th Street and 2nd Street. 4th Street has become a permanent access, uh, beach access. It's been built into the bluff now. And uh, as for 2nd Street, it will be a permanent beach access. It is one right now, but um, it has... a. Uh, and the land use um, is supposed to be 20 foot ac access from A Street. So if a permanent sign could be put up there, it will help control the motel people to keep the fires on the motel property and not sway over to the A Street property. Maybe also stop the drug users from going to A Street property and starting fires as 
Chief Gillespie will vouch for many times there's been fires there. So please adopt the ordinance um, and put up extra signage. Thank you. All right, thank you for your public comment. All righty. Do we have uh, any additional conversation or questions for staff? All right. Can I have a motion? I'd like to entertain a motion at this time then. Mayor, I, I move that we waive full reading, read by title only, and adopt ordinance number 827U, an urgency ordinance of the City Council of the City of Crescent City, amending section 12.20.030, restriction on location and use of beach fires on certain public beaches of chapter uh, 12.20 park regulations of title uh, 12 streets, sidewalks, and public places of the Crescent City Municipal Code. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. And before we pull the vote, I will close this hearing. Uh, clerk, please poll the vote. Council Member Altman? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Wright? No. Mayor Pro Tem Inscore? Yes. And Mayor Greeno? Yes. Thank you. All right, moving on to agenda item number 11, which is the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan Water Shor Shortage Contingency Plan. And I'll open up that hearing at this time. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor Greenow, members of the council. I would like Director Olson to uh, to present this item to the uh, to the council, and I believe we're also joined uh, by uh, by our consultant who assisted uh, in writing this to answer any, any questions you might have. Director Olson. Thank you very much. Uh, 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. Um, what this is really about is just uh, following state law, which requires us to update this plan every five years. Um, in, in general, we don't anticipate uh, any specific water shortages. Um, and what I'd like to do is ask Warren, the consultant uh, with Freshwater Environmental, who put this together, to, uh, to run through some of the details with you. Uh, and answer any questions that you might have about the uh, the data that's being presented tonight or the urban water management plan itself. All right, welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, as, as John said, the um, 2020 urban water management plan is a requirement that every five years that all municipalities over a certain size that, that you update those plans. And what it does is it looks at your water use history and it looks at the um, water supply, what water supplies you have available. You project your water demand based on uh, population change, and then you match that up with your um, with the supply. Now you're in a really great situation with your um, your groundwater basin is ranked very low. It doesn't need to have a groundwater management plan, and it's relatively unaffected. You know the way that we look at this is. Historically, we look at the driest year and the impact on water levels during the driest year and, and the Smith River flow, and then during the five, the five driest years. And so from a historical perspective, even during these significant uh, variations in precipitation, the water table is stable and shows very little effect of a single dry year or five-year uh, five uh, dry period. And then it also has a requirement to do the update your water shortage contingency plan. And it has various stages that you can implement with various restrictions. And it's all, um, you know, under state code, you're allowed to do this and your local ordinance allows you to do this. Um, there's been some changes in the water shortage contingency plan. And the most important one I think is that they're requiring an annual, uh, every single year, you'll be required to look at your water supply and the um, demand and then provide a report to the city council and ultimately then it'll go to the uh, to the department of water resources annually um, which it makes you look at your every year it makes you look at your water levels and where you're at so i think it's pretty i think it's a pretty good addition to the plan all right, all right. Thank you. do we 
we have any questions for uh, Mr. Pl Pl Plotcher? Locker, yeah, that's fine. Locker at this time from the council. So is it okay to water my lawn? As long as it doesn't run off on the hard surface, you know, overwatering is against, you know, it's just like should not be done. I do, when I drive around Crescent City, I've seen some pretty big gardens and where there are, is water coming out on sidewalks and going down the gutter. So watering is fine as long as it doesn't result in um, runoff. All right. Are there any other restrictions that we should abide by? No, not at this time. Not at this time. You've got, um, you know, you're a lot better than most parts of the state. That's experiencing drought and water levels declining, groundwater levels going down and whatnot. And you've got a, a very solid, you know, one of the best producing uh, watersheds, groundwater basin that's that's in the state. Thank you so much. Or some, sometimes we get caught by just statewide regulations too, which was what occurred, you know, a, a couple of years ago, if I remember correctly. But, but nothing, even though there's a lot of talk right now and reservoirs are down, Shasta Lake is, is down, the state hasn't implemented any statewide measures that you're aware of. Is that correct? No, they're watershed specific. And the closest that would affect you would be the Klamath is, in, um, is part of those regulations. And so I think Del Norte County is listed just because the uh, climate borders uh, goes through as a portion of down north. Um, but that's the only, you know, that's just the only way that it touches you right now. Gotcha. And, the, and those regulations were before they had a lot of these groundwater management, you know, plans and bases in place too. So it might be a different scenario as they go to start to look at, you know, these areas. So maybe it's not a, a statewide one shoe fits all as it, as it comes down. Do you have, do you have any insight on that? I know I'm, put me on the spot. So I do uh, apologize. No, I was looking today at some of that and there it's not statewide, although there's pressure to make it statewide. I think Humboldt and Del Norte are in unique situations with the abundance of water that we have. And so I really appreciate the regulations not painting a brush on all of this, all the same. Great. Well, that's great to hear. Hopefully it remains that way. All right, do we have any further questions or comments for Mr. Um, Blocker? All right, do we have any public comment? Here, I don't see any hands raised. And no emails have been received. All right, thank you. At this time, I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, I, I make a motion that we adopt resolution 2021-35, uh, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Crescent City, adopting the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, at this time, we'll, I will close this public hearing, and I will ask for a the clerk to pull the vote. Yes, Council Member Altman. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Wright. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Inscor. Yes. And Mayor Greeno. Yes. Hey, thank you for your support on this routine matter. And thank you for your hard work on it. All right, moving on to our last public hearing of the evening, which is our fiscal year 2021-2022 budget and appropriations limit. I'll open that public hearing at this time. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor Gina, members of the council. Just want to personally thank the council for all of your efforts leading up to uh, this report and hopefully this adoption of this year's budget. It is never easy. Uh, it's taken a, a lot of staff time, months to get to this point. The council met uh, for two nights in a row, gave us clear direction, and Linda, as always, have, has done an excellent job. Uh, we're fortunate to have her as our finance director and, uh, and this effort that she has taken on to present this budget tonight and, and, and create this budget has been, uh, has been no small feat. So with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Director Lee. Thank you and good evening mayor and council members. So um, as Mr. Weir mentioned, tonight is the public hearing to formally adopt the budget for fiscal year 21-22. 
Um, it's actually the culmination of several months of work that has gone into this. And I will start my presentation if I can find the right button. Okay. So um, what we are requesting tonight, um, obviously open the public hearing, which you've already done, um, receive the staff report, then we will um, ask for any questions from the council, public comment, council discussion, um, close the public hearing and uh, adopt two resolutions, one for the budget and one for the appropriations limit. So just as a quick reminder, um, the city uh, follows these best practices when budgeting. We try to use conservative but realistic estimates. We budget for all of the authorized employee positions and anticipated expenses. And if all goes according to plan, our actual expenses should always end up lower than our budget. The process that we take, um, this actually started in March this year. We get budget requests from every department of the city. The city manager and I review line by line every, every expense in every single department. We meet with the departments uh, multiple times to go through everything and, and make any changes. Then there's a workshop um, to get public input and uh, council direction. That was May 24th and 25th this year. Uh, the next step is the public hearing, which is tonight, formally adopt the budget. And then we monitor and update throughout the year. So at the budget workshop in May, um, there were several items discussed. Um, the budget that is presented tonight includes all of the items that were approved by council at the budget workshop. So all of the Measure S expenditures that were approved are included in this budget. The organizational staffing changes in the IT department, city attorney, finance, and HR. The lifeguards at the pool will be back to fully staffed. We added one seasonal parks maintenance worker and one part-time recreation lead to start in January. We added the additional marketing funding for the RV park, the swimming pool, and city events. We've added funding for the design work for City Hall. We added the RV park amenities and an additional payment toward the PERS liability. Things that were not included, these, these were discussed at the workshop, but just as a refresher um, for anyone from, from the public who was not able to attend, these are all considerations that will be coming back to the council um, at upcoming meetings. So these things are not in the budget as presented tonight. Um, the labor negotiations, as you know, all four of our employee bargaining units are currently in negotiations. Um, we have uh, Johnson Controls energy efficiency projects um, that are potentially gonna be done. I believe they're on a later item in tonight's agenda. The economic development projects, um, as we discussed, there's a potential need to borrow for some short-term cash flow needs uh, for large projects that may be coming up. Uh, Beachfront Park, if we are successful with our Prop 68 grant application, um, Front Street, we've actually um, applied for an infra grant and we are in the process of applying for a raise grant. And then the Pebble Beach Bank Stabilization, the next phase of that project. Um, it's possible that the city will need to do some short-term borrowing um, to fund those projects while we wait for grant reimbursement. And then we also have potential grant matches. If we receive the infra grant for Front Street, um, and the next phase of the Pebble Beach project. Um, both of those potentially come with some grant matches that would need to be funded. And then the city facility projects um, that are potentially um, gonna be considered for debt financing, which are city hall and the police department. So just things to keep in mind. So I'm going to give just a very high level summary of each fund here and then ask if you have questions about any specifics, um, but all of these were discussed in detail those couple of days in, in May at the budget workshop. So revenues in the general fund, 
in the proposed budget, um, 7,385,000 expenditures, 700, excuse me, 7,990,000 for a net of negative 605,000. So let's um, talk about what's included in those numbers. Some things to keep in mind. The pool revenue that's in the budget before you tonight um, was assuming that we would have swimming lessons only because that's where we were um, when we prepared this budget. Once we are allowed to go back to normal operations when all the COVID restrictions and everything are lifted, um, the increase in revenue would be 162,000. Also keep in mind that expenditures um, typically come in under our budget. Our, our five-year average, over the last five years, we've been 10% under budget. When we discussed our projections at the budget workshop, those projections assumed we would be 5% under budget. So it was conservative, um, but it is important for the council to know that you are, if you approve this budget, you are theoretically authorizing all of that money to be spent. Um, We've never done it in the last five years, but that is technically what you would be approving. So if the pool revenue does get adjusted, um, if we are able to open up fully um, and adjust the revenues, and then if the expenses come in 5% under, what you would be looking at is an actual net of $43,000. As we discussed at the workshop, there's a difference between our ongoing budget or the operational budget and one-time expenses. So when we looked at the operational budget and we looked at the annual revenues that we expect to continue year after year versus the ongoing expenses year after year, there was approximately a $200,000 surplus. The one-time expenses, um, things that um, can be funded just once um, and they can come out of the general fund balance. Um, some examples that are included in this year's budget are the design work for City Hall, for example. Um, again, just an important reminder, labor negotiations are not yet included because they are still underway and the budget to actual variance can change. Um, so when thinking about that operational surplus, it wouldn't be prudent to commit all of it, um, you know, at this time. So the fund balance that we'll be looking at for the general fund, um, it's always sort of a moving target uh, because the current fiscal year ends in nine days, uh, but we won't actually know the official results for a couple of months after that. There's a, there's a whole lot of year-end work that has to get done before we know what the final numbers will be. Based on information that we have um, through May, we are currently projecting that we're going to end at um, 2.5, almost 2.6 million at the end of this current fiscal year. However, we won't know for sure for several more months. So looking at a couple of different possible scenarios, um, in the yellow section you can see the fund balance last June, and that is an actual number that's been audited, uh, was 1.4 million. If in our current fiscal year, which is almost over, if we spent everything that was budgeted, we would end up just over 2 million in our general fund. Um, and then if next year we again spent every single dollar that's proposed, we would end up back at the 1.4 million, which is an 18% reserve. That's what I'm sort of calling our worst case scenario. Um, that would take the city uh, spending every single possible budgeted dollar two years in a row, which again has not happened in the last five years. Then in the blue, you can see sort of a middle of the road scenario. You start with the $1.4 million that we know for sure from last June. And the, uh, the staff estimate of where I think we're going to end up for this year of the 2.5 million, and then say next year, we do spend every single dollar. We would end up at 1.9 million or 25% reserve. And then what I consider a more likely scenario 
Um, the yellow section is exactly the same, just showing that sort of if we spent every single dollar two years in a row. But in the blue section, it's if we have our current year projection, we would end up at 2.5 million. And then next year, if we are able to increase our pool revenues, and if our budget to actual savings is at least 5%, we would end up at the 2.5 million or 32% reserve, which is a more likely scenario, but again, not guaranteed. This is uh, the same that we showed you before, but just as a reminder, if there's anything you want to ask about um, or more just things to keep in mind that will be coming back to the council for consideration, these are the items that um, council will be making decisions on in the upcoming months, and they are not yet included in these numbers. Um, before I move on, do you have any questions about the general fund? Not seeing any? No. Okay. In the Housing Authority, uh, just very briefly, um, we have uh, revenues currently budgeted at just over 3.9 million, expenses also 3.9 million. There's a slight negative in the net of about $5,000, um, which would bring the fund balance to $322,000. And this does include spending the CARES Act money that the Housing Authority received. Um, but does not yet include the item that's later on the agenda tonight for an additional uh, funding program. So this would be the housing authority budget uh, that you would be approving tonight um, with future revisions probably to come. In the RV park, the budget as presented, revenues just under 420,000 and expenses 498,000 for a net of a negative, just about 79,000. So let me show you what that looks like for the working capital balance. Um, same concept here, the yellowish section on the left is if we spent every dollar that was possible. Um, for both the year that's just about to end and the upcoming year. Uh, working capital at the end of next year would end up at 185,000 if we spent everything that was authorized. Uh, a little bit more likely scenario, um, if, if this current year comes in as we are expecting, and then next year we spent everything that was budgeted, um, the working capital would end up at 245,000. So something to keep in mind for the RV Perk Fund is the working capital balance is um, what the council can consider to reinvest back into the park. Um, so some of those capital improvements that we were discussing, some future plans for the park, that's the number um, that we'll be working with. In the sewer fund, um, there's a lot of numbers here, but basically um, I'm showing you in this column here that fiscal 20-21, that's the current fiscal year that again is ending at the end of this month. This is what our current projections are showing. Um, at, the, at the bottom there, the working capital um, is projected to end up at about $5.4 million. The proposed budget that is before you tonight um, would bring the working capital down to $3.6 million at the end of next year. So there are some important things included in that proposed budget that I have on the next slide. So um, when we look at the last five or six years, our working capital has been increasing, um, but just this last year has now started to decline. The increase was due to the fact that we had expenses coming in under budget, we had staff positions that we were not able to keep filled, and also we had a lot of major maintenance and CIP that was getting um, deferred. Our long-term forecasts um, have repeatedly shown that the sewer fund is in a structural deficit. So it has money now, but when we project forward showing the expenses and the revenues, it shows that that working capital is going to go negative. Um, however, 
we did receive um, funding from the state to do an updated study in this, this next fiscal year. So we will get new long-term forecasts from that. Um, and also we'll be revising our capital improvement plans. So those are important things um, that will be coming for the sewer fund. So included in the proposed budget, um, we are proposing to dip into that working capital that's been built up over the last couple of years to fund some uh, capital improvements. These are the same projects that were discussed at the uh, budget workshop. So the Mempulse um, being the largest one, we've talked about that one for several years. Um, and then some other projects that were recommended by uh, Jacobs Engineering. Plus, um, as we've been doing the last couple of years, it's there's a carryover of CIP from this year that's been started but isn't yet finished. In the water fund, uh, we are showing that the estimate for this year, uh, working capital will end up, we believe, around $2.9 million. Um, again, these numbers won't be finalized for a few months. Um, but if that turns out to be uh, the case, and then with the next year's proposed budget would bring the working capital down to about $1.8 million. Again, you can see um, the, biggest, uh, the biggest change there is because of capital improvements. So what's included? Uh, we are continuing work on the Amador tank project and getting going on the Washington tank project and then adding some generators um, to increase our resiliency. And again, carrying over the projects from this year that are not yet finished. And then just as a, another note um, in the budget document that was, it was included in the agenda packet and it's also been posted on the city website um, for about a week and a half. Um, the city has lots of other minor funds. Uh, we typically talk about the five major funds, but we do have other things. We have general CIP, we have internal services, which are things like IT and insurance and building maintenance. We have special revenue funds, which are like our grant programs, um, and some fiduciary funds where we're setting aside money for, the, uh, for OPEB and, and the successor agency. And every single fund, every single department is presented in the attached budget document. There are two other items that are included. Um, one is the position control, and that includes all of the changes that were approved at the budget workshop, including the, you know, the staffing changes that we discussed and the reorganizations that were approved for IT and finance, um, et cetera. And then also the appropriations limit. So this is required under the state constitution. Um, we have to update this annually. And basically it calculates the maximum of tax revenue that we are allowed to spend in a given year. And the calculation just shows that we are under our limit. So what we are requesting from the council, um, again, is, you know, if you have questions, public comment, discussion, um, and then asking you to close the public hearing and adopt the two resolutions. All right. Thank you so much for all of your hard work on that budget uh, and, and all the, the graphs and, and everything to help make it uh, more palatable for everyone to understand. Um, and for all of our staff who have put in hours of time and um, the oversight committee, as well as the council, we, we've all put in a lot of a lot of time on this. So, uh, do we have any questions or comments on the current proposed budget from the council? I have a question on. I think it was like one of the first slides that you should. Okay. It was the general fund was showing a negative, was that right? So let me put it back on the screen so that I can make sure I'm looking at the same slide that you are. I, I didn't want to interrupt you in your slides because you were like on a roll. <laughs> no problem. Um, so was it, 
This one that you were looking at? Uh, I believe so, yes it was. Okay, so this is showing that in the budget that is before you tonight, the revenues are less than the expenses. So that's the negative 605,000. That money will come out of the built up reserve in the general fund. Okay, okay, because that- Oh, sorry. You answered my question. Oh, okay. And that's just in theory. Um, again, that's if we spent every single dollar that's in the budget, but we never do. So that's why then we showed if things came in more like we would anticipate, you would actually be looking at this number uh, for a more realistic number of what would happen. But the budget you would be approving is this one officially. Okay, but I, I but we have we have this to cover this right negative. I, yes. I just didn't want to. Yes. I mean, I, I'm not a numbers guy. Yes. But, uh, no. That's that's a, it's a good question. So in this yellow section that I'm showing you here, um, you can see that if if the council approves the budget that's presented tonight and our reserve decreases by six hundred thousand, we would still end up with one point four million even after that. You uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Do we have any further questions or comments from the council? All right, let's open up public comment at this time. Mayor, I don't see any hands raised from our Zoom attendees. And Mayor, no emails. Thank you very much. All right, then at this time, I will close this public hearing and entertain a motion for our budget. Well, it looks like there's two, right? Yes. Two separate ones. Yeah. And I believe that we can take both at the same time. Is that correct, uh, Attorney Rice? Um, you can take them both at the same time, yes. Um, it might be better for the record to do them separately. So it's just nice and clean for the minutes and everything. Okay. Well, well I'll, I'll make a motion to adopt, for the first one to adopt, uh, resolution number 2021-33, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Crescent City adopting the annual budget for fiscal year 20. 2021-22. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any public comment? No public comment at this time. All Sorry. right, please pull the vote. Council Member Altman? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem and score? Yes. And Mayor Freedom? Yes. I'll entertain a second motion for the, I believe it's. Oh, it's Appropriations limit. Yeah. Mayor, I make a motion we adopt resolution 2021 34, resolution of the City Council of the City of Crescent City, uh, selecting the annual adjustment factors for the calculation of the fiscal year 2021 22 appropriations limit for the City of Crescent City. That. All right, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please pull the vote. Council Member Altman? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Inscore? Yes. And Mayor Freedom? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, moving on in our agenda, that it was our last public hearing. Uh, we're going to be moving on to the Crescent City Housing Authority, so we are going to adjourn as the Crescent City City Council at this time, and we're going to call to order a, uh, the uh, Housing Authority at this time, and we have some new business today, so we have an emergency housing voucher memorandum of understanding between CCHA and NorCal Con continuum of care. 
and let the uh, minutes reflect that the entire council is still here. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor Greenow, members of the council. We have our housing authority director, Megan Miller here, and she has another exciting opportunity to, uh, to share with the council tonight. Ms. Miller. Thank you. Yeah, it is very exciting. We learned in May that we are going to be receiving an allocation of 15 emergency housing vouchers. This is a brand new program that was introduced under the American Rescue Plan. And so because it's brand new, there's a lot of moving parts. We've spent the last month and a half immersed in understanding how all of it works and, and trying to figure out how it will all play out. The, um, the goal of EHV is to reduce homelessness. So in order to qualify, you need to meet the criteria. There's four criteria, experiencing homelessness, at risk of experiencing homelessness, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence and uh, or having a high risk of housing instability. And the design of the program is for housing authorities to partner with their local continuum of care. That is usually referred to as the COC. And for any of you who might not be familiar with the COC, it's a consortium of individuals and entities who come together within communities to address issues of homelessness. Del Norte is a member of the NORICAL COC, which is the lead agency is Shasta. And there are uh, seven different counties that are represented in the NorCal COC. There's Del Norte, Lassen, Modoc, Plumas, Shasta, Siskiyou, and Sierra. And we have an established relationship with the COC um, because we are represented on the, the local advisory board for, for Del Norte. However, in order to administer EHV, HUD is requiring a more um, formalized relationship, and that's in the, the form of the MOU. That MOU is what I'm seeking approval for tonight. The MOU outlines the different roles and responsibilities, and um, just to give an overview of what the partnership will look like, there is a software called HMIS, housing management information system. And there are two entities in Del Norte County who use this software um, as to, to enter people in and that's Del Norte Mission Possible and Department of Health and Human Services. So if they encounter a homeless client, they can take their information and put them into this HMIS system, which is used to track them and connect them with the services that they need. So what will happen is the, as these individuals are entered into the system, they're assessed for vulnerability. The higher you rank on that scale for vulnerability, the higher on the prioritization list you go. The COC will draw, will extract that data that Del Norte Mission Possible and Department of Health and Human Services are putting in. And from that, they will create a by name list for Del Norte County. And this is, this is what's known as coordinated entry. They're wanting to make sure that the individuals who are the highest on that vulnerability scale are served first. So all of the referrals that we get for EHV will come from that process. They'll come directly from that by name list, which is generated by the information input by the two access points. The only exception to that is for referrals that will be coming from the, um, the individuals who are referred under the domestic violence criteria. For those referrals, we will take direct written referrals from the victim service provider, which is Harrington House. And that's why you see them also mentioned in the MOU as a third party um, agency. So once we receive the referral, the EHV will be issued to the referred individual and then all parties will work together to try and connect them with housing. We are all going into this with our eyes wide open. We know that it's not going to be easy, but there are some benefits that HUD has included in this program to try and make it a little easier. 
with each EHV voucher, there will be a, an amount of $3,500, which they are calling service fees. And those funds can be used to help individuals under EHV with security deposits, with landlord incentive, with other household um, essentials, towels, um, blankets, dishes, things that they, they don't already have. And um, the, the participants will have the options to choose which, which of those buckets of money they, they need the most. We do see that the toughest part is going to be finding places for, for them to live. So we know that the landlord incentive is gonna be important. And security deposits have always been a hurdle for our participants. It's a lot of money to come up with, and we have never had the ability previously to assist with that. So it will be um, very interesting to see how much of an impact that makes. That's something that housing authorities have been asking for for many years. So, um, you know, we'll see how that goes. What we're envisioning is something like $2,000 for a deposit, $1,000 for a landlord incentive pay and $500 for whatever other needs they have. But, you know, again, that that is remains to be seen and it is based on what each individual needs that that they have. So the approval of the MOU officially clears us to to get the program underway. And um, as Lyndon mentioned, there are some financial impacts, obviously, to, uh, to our program, which were not included in the current budget because we did not have the information at our disposal when we were working on budget preparation. So we will be back in July to request a budget adjustment to include the anticipated revenue and expenses that will go along with, with EHV. And once we get our, you know, our hands on it and we have some experience under our belt, we will be back to report on, on how successful it's going. Hopefully it's successful and, and not unsuccessful. It just remains to be seen. We're, we're very excited about it though. The staff is really excited about it. Um, the, the local advisory board is excited about it. We've been working really closely with Department of Health and Human Services and Del Norte Mission Possible and Harrington House and, and the reception has been really great. All right, thank you, Megan, for your uh, presentation on that. And what an op opportunity, what an exciting opportunity we have. Um, I'll open it up to the council this time. Do you, any of our counselors have uh, any questions or comments concerning this program? I have a couple of questions, Mayor. Uh, Megan, the, the $3,500, is that a, that a, a single one-time allocation per EHV? Yes. Okay. So um, when it comes to landlord incentive, it's about getting them in. It's not about, I mean, the idea is get them in. You're yeah. already going to get paid fair rental value. So it's it's to try to find those new landlords who maybe have not been amenable to doing Section 8 housing in the past. That's exactly right. Okay. Second question that I have of these 15, is there, if I read this correctly, um, these vouchers stay in effect as long as a person stays in the program, but then after whatever it is, 2023, if a person leaves the program, then we lose that voucher. Is that, is, is that am I reading that correctly? So yes. it's not like these people are, they have two years on this program. The voucher stays in effect as long as a person is, they, they don't have to continue to meet any other criteria. It becomes like a regular housing voucher once somebody's in the program? Yes, that's correct. So what will happen is in a normal case, you know, somebody um, gives up their voucher and then it just automatically becomes available again. Right. And that will be the case for these vouchers until September of 2023. 20 right, yeah. And then once that happens, they can remain on the program until 2045 if they want. They will continue to have that, that housing assistance. It's just that once that voucher closes out, it's not reissued under EHV. Okay. Um, 
uh, one last, um, well, a question and then maybe a comment. Um, ha have, have you done a, a preliminary uh, scan of our waiting list to see if any of the people who are on our waiting list, in fact, might um, meet uh, the EHV uh, criteria? Yes, that's a very good question. And what we're planning to do is to issue a letter to everyone on the waiting list, telling them about this program and telling them that if they meet this criteria, they should get in touch with either Department of Health and Human Services or uh, Donut Mission Possible for one of those access points to get them into the HMIS system. And then that's how we will take the referrals through the coordinated entry. Okay. And I guess just an observation, I'm very excited about this because obviously as a, uh, as a partner with Del Norte Mission Possible, we have, uh, we have uh, six uh, uh, women who are in transitional housing right now that meet this criteria that may be able to get into permanent housing while connected to services, which will now open up spots uh, in, in our house to be able to provide for um, that next uh, that next group of of people who uh, need tra transitional housing. So uh, couldn't be a better timing uh, for where uh, uh, Del Mission Possible is in the program right now. In that we have some graduates who uh, you know are ready to to rebuild their life on their their own. And so this is amazing. Uh, it really is. And I appreciate all the hard work. I. Um, I've always said that, that we're going to keep building this program up and all these, all these lofty goals that I remember talking to you about um, six plus years ago, um, you know, coming out of sequestration. And here we are, we're, we're seeing these, what may have seemed like um, pipe dreams when, when we talked about them back then, but uh, the impact that's being made on individual families in our, in our community is amazing. And uh, so thank you very much. Appreciate all thank the hard work. You. All right. Do we have any further questions or comments from uh, the board? Uh, I'll just say it would be nice if we did not need these, but uh, we do have needs in our community and what an exciting opportunity this is to continue to help those in need in our community. Um, at this time, let's open up public comment then. Any public comment? No public comment from our Zoom audience. And uh, none from email there. All right, thank you. Then I will close, well, actually, this isn't a hearing. Uh, at this time, I'll entertain a motion for this program. Make a motion we approve the memorandum of understanding between the Crescent City Housing Authority and the NorCal Continuum of Care for the purpose of administering emergency housing vouchers. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please pull the vote. Yes. Board Member Altman? Yes. Board Member Smith? Yes. Board Member Wright? Yes. Vice Chair Inscore? Yes. And Chairman Greeno? Yes. Thank you. All right. That was the only uh, item on our Housing Authority docket today. So I will close. Uh, I will adjourn this meeting of the Housing Authority and reconvene as the Crescent City City Council. We do not have anything on our agenda for the successor agency to the redevelopment agency. So we will move on to continue, well, no continuing business. We'll move on to new business. Uh, item number 14 our, on our agenda is the pool fees. Thank you, Mayor Greenow, members of the council. I'll ask uh, our recreation director, Ms. Holly Went, to uh, start her video. But this item is coming back uh, to the council with one new item uh, added as well. So there's some exciting news as well and some exciting opportunities. First, the, uh, when the council was considering pool fees, they asked staff to go out and obtain additional public comments uh, and additional public uh, uh, reactions to the proposed fees. And so with that, Director Went organized a community meeting and I will let her tell you all about it and some of the, uh, the feedback that we did receive. 
Good evening, Mayor Greeno and council members. So yeah, as a uh, city manager, we said after uh, presenting the proposed fees to you on uh, May 3rd, we went out on May 18th and uh, reached out to the community via our huge newsletter group that we, we reach out to that are pool patrons that sign up for that Facebook city website. And we really reached out and tried to get as many people there as possible. Uh, we had our meeting on the 18th. We had 14 uh, members of the community in, in attendance. We also uh, recorded the meeting so that other people who would like to be part of it and provide feedback would be able to do that and posted the YouTube video up for the community to watch and also uh, were, was able to let people know how to provide feedback to city staff and the aquatics team. Uh, that discussion, discussion included the proposed fees, pool revenue ex and expenditures, went over with the community, um, the master plan recommendations, winter sale prices. We talked about the additional supports for seniors and youth aquatics team are working on our wonderful um, marketing uh, uh, goals for this next year and really possible reopening opportunities for the pool. So with that, um, I'd like to share my screen real quick. We had a really neat opportunity for them to provide feedback. And let me share real quick. Can you see my screen there? Yes. Um, and this was an, a neat thing to do. What do you miss most about our pool? And the community feedback was the slide, lap swimming, staff swim lessons, Sunday swim and uh, lap swim. So lap swimming is something a lot of the patrons there really feel strongly about. Uh, a lot of the patrons that visited that and gave feedback are our regular exercise and lap swimming patrons. And it was really wonderful to get their feedback. They were overwhelmingly supportive of the proposed fee increases um, after explaining um, the methodology for the increases. They did not seem to support the winter, winter sale prices. They felt that the discount was already part of that uh, annual fee. Um, and they were eager to, for the full to reopen. They pro provided feedback and were supportive of the overall direction the aquatics team is taking. And in the following weeks, we really reached out trying to get more feedback after. And we did not receive any feedback during the meeting or afterwards, opposing the fee increases or expressing that the fees were um, too expensive for our community currently. Um, so it was a really wonderful opportunity to meet with the community. Uh, Council member Altman was there. Our aquatic supervisor, Alyssa Garcia was there. And Mr. Weir was there as well with my myself uh, during that time to go over that and answer any questions that the patrons or community members had about the proposed fees. Um, uh, at that time, we went over the recommendations that were presented to City Council on the, the 3rd of May. Uh, those were the, the fees of increasing the um, adult daily use fee and decreasing the youth fee and using that base daily fee as the methodology for a 10 punch pass um, as nine visits and you get the 10th free taking that same methodology, moving up to the new proposed monthly fees, um, having it be nine months, uh, uh, 10 visits, and then the additional uh, visits for a monthly pass would be free. Um, and then the yearly pass, which most of the patrons at our meetings were yearly pass holders or 50 punch pass holders and explaining the methodology for the yearly pass, uh, the cost being nine months and those remaining three months for free. Um, this was explained, great conversations with the community about it, and really the idea that the methodology is there. So as time goes on, as costs increase, we can incrementally have a plan on how to adjust um, with the economy and with where the community's going. So there was great feedback for that. 
Uh, we also uh, discuss the recommendations for swimming lessons and why these are the current suggested prices, show the comparisons to other pools in other communities, and really discussed how the increasing minimum wage had ex has impacted the expenditures for the pool and how we're just doing minimal increases for swim lessons to kind of offset some of that, and also increasing the price for lifeguard trainings. Um, we really talked with the community about uh, the city's goal of, of working with them, making sure that swimming lessons and aquatic services are still reasonable to the community, working with community partners to be able to offset some of those costs for our um, low income families and our seniors. Uh, but overall, it was a wonderful meeting with the community. And we've had, I've had other conversations in the community after that. And I'm really happy to say really supportive of, of the city and where the aquatics team is going with this. Right, thank you, Ms. Went for your presentation and thank you for spending the time to, to have that engagement with the community uh, as we had asked. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the council at this time? There, I will just say there, there are two asks so for tonight. There's one with the, the fee schedule, and then the other is for council approval to uh, move forward with reopening fully on July 5th. And so that would be back to a, a full schedule. And I think Ms. Went uh, can kind of run through that real briefly as well on what that might look like. And so th those are the two, uh, two actions from the council. Oh. Yeah, so the other um, recommendation is given that Governor Newsom has opened up the economy and thoroughly reviewing what that how that impacts uh, swimming pools, we're really excited to recommend a full reopening of, of the swimming pool. That will include locker rooms being open, all aquatic services being available to the community, including, including lap swim, exercise, recreational swims for families. Um, and then we'll also follow uh, state guidance and have signage available. And we, based on these, uh, this reopening plan and we're currently hiring new lifeguards in anticipation of the full opening based on Governor Newsom's announcements, we're really looking forward to a July 5th full opening celebration date for the community. Um, and we have a tentative schedule. Um, as you can see, we'll have our early morning open as, as we've always had historically with lap swims, um, group swimming lessons. We've designed the current swimming lessons so it will easily fit into this schedule whenever it is implemented. It will not affect the ongoing registration of swim lessons that we're currently doing. It fits seamlessly into this schedule. Um, exercise lap swim, open recreation swims, and we're working right now with masters, uh, the swim team and our other community partners to make sure these times that have historically been their recommended and preferred times for scheduling work with them. So if we do proceed with a full opening, this schedule may tweak based on their input and needs coming um, into this full opening. Thank you, uh, Director Wynn. I'll just say just one more thing, and that is a, uh, you know, the council just approved the, the budget. We saw it was a deficit budget this year. Things are things are still tight for the city. Measure S is providing $325,000 to, to go into this pool to allow it to, uh, to be open. If we didn't have those funds for Measure S, those negative numbers that, uh, that you were talking about, Council Smith and the council saw, those would be $325,000 worse than than what we currently saw or the council couldn't have done a lot of those those other things that uh, that the council has adopted to, to reach a budget like this there would have had to have been those kind of cuts to allow this to happen and allow this pool facility to be open all right thank you do we have any questions or comments from the council I'm is there a particular oh sorry <laughs> jumping in the fee structure uh or the um opening of the pool was there a particular reason we chose uh july 5th um just to be able to have enough time to pull the new staff on board to open that we we've had a very limited staffing schedule currently so just to be able to give our staff enough time to accommodate their schedules to make sure that they have time off some of them have other jobs child care other things to consider um so as soon as we get this this gives them enough uh 
excuse me, time to make those accommodations, as well as giving us enough time to get out there and tell the community, hey, you guys, we're open, you know, so they can be ready and we can have a really great opening day after 4th of July weekend. I'm really excited. This is so great. Um, seeing the economy open this, this month uh, on June 15th, and now we're going to get our pool open on the, on the 5th, right after Independence Day. Couldn't have asked for, for, for much more. I mean, this is such a great thing. Um, all right. Uh, any further questions or comments or conversation from the council concerning what we're talking about? All right, we'll open up public comment then. Looks like we do have one hand raised, Mayor. Sandra Sopola. All right, welcome. Looks like we are having a, a little bit of a security problem uh, with that particular uh, account. So what I'd like to do is let me, uh, let me put up the phone number to call. Uh, and possibly they can call in and that will alleviate any, uh, any security uh, concerns that we, uh, we might have. All right. Sandra, if you could call us on uh, your phone, uh, dial 253-215-8782. And then when prompted for the webinar ID, please dial 865-3454. 1165. And that way we can take your public comment over the phone. This is just a reflection of, of Zoom and updating some of their security settings. So it's just that you have to have a certain uh, version of Zoom downloaded. That's what we do run into this from time to time. So we'll give her a, a minute to, to give us a call. While we're waiting, um, uh, Ms. Holly, did we um, get, hear anything back from the school district about the fourth grader uh, swim lessons? Yeah, uh, City Manager Weir and I met with uh, the S Superintendent Harris, and we're looking forward to next year um, being able to provide swim lessons to last year's fifth graders and this year's fourth graders. We're going to divide it up between the, uh, the two sessions. And make sure it works within in their time frame, but it looks like we'll have time to be able to. Nice. Thank you for following. Yeah. We'll also uh, add one bit of information that I was saving for my uh, city manager report, but Ms. Went and I will both be in attendance uh, for the healthcare districts uh, meeting tomorrow in which they are looking at adopting their budget. Uh, per their agenda, they have a proposal to uh, to donate or to fund the uh, the swimming lessons uh, sponsor uh, possibly is the, the right terminology but uh, to fund all swimming lessons for our pool and so they have a budget amount of forty five thousand dollars listed states in the report forty thousand dollars to the actual program of funding swim lessons and then an additional five thousand to help us advertise and get the word out so this would essentially make swimming lessons uh, free for anybody that that wanted them. That is that is their goal. So we'll be in attendance to their budget meeting tomorrow night. This isn't a for sure thing, but it is uh, it is something that they will be discussing. Uh, and then if it is uh, acted upon and is included, then we would be coming back to the council for a budget amendment, uh, and then we would be able to uh, to implement that and advertise that as part of the the reopening timing of that. Probably wouldn't be as soon as July fifth, but it could be as soon as possibly uh, you know, July 19th and those sessions of swimming lessons because there's already reservations and whatnot for, uh, for some of those others. How exciting, what a, what a great opportunity to partner and, and get more, more children uh, trained in how to swim. Safety is important, especially living so close to the water here. It, it looks like we're still having issues with uh, Ms. Cipolla. Uh, um, she has not called in yet. Um, if you could put up the, the screen for public comment again, just to give her an opportunity to, to look at the public comment at, uh, if you could just, uh, email us your public comment, uh, you could either, either, either email it 
at public comment at crescentcity.org, or you can go onto the city's website and email uh, the council directly. Our emails are on there as well. Um, if I could just, as we're waiting, um, do a little shout out to the aquatics team down at Fred Ender Pool. I really want council to know that um, providing swim lessons all day long is really um, a, a, a very high energy, uh, a very focused, dedicated service to provide. And we have a team that shows up and does four hour chunks at a time of back to back swim lessons with multiple parents and kids. And they, they just lesson after lesson. And it's just an amazing team and they're supporting each other and working together. And I'm really excited um, for them to have an opportunity to practice those other lifeguarding skills, um, offering aerobics and being able to do some of the other things because, you know, teaching swim lessons and lifeguarding is really tough. It's tons of energy and time and they have been tireless this whole time. Um, providing session after session of swim lessons. So I really want to thank that aquatics team down there and all those lifeguards for the hard work they've been doing to provide as many lessons as possible um, during the, the, the limited services that we've been able to, to provide. All right. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have not received a phone call and I have not received an email. Have we received an email from uh her on yes, the, oh, okay all right well we we do have to continue on in our agenda um miss uh, sapola if uh, you could email us your public comment your your comments are very important to us uh, i don't know why zoom's not working for you um but we do have to move on with our agenda at this time so with that i will if there isn't any further public comment i'll close public comment and I will entertain a motion for the two action items uh, that we have today. Mayor, I'd make a motion that we uh, authorize staff to go ahead and implement the, uh, the fee structure as presented and that we uh, open the pool fully to a full program on July 5th. Second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please pull the vote. Yes. Uh, Council Member Altman? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Inscore? Yes. And Mayor Greeno? Yes. Thank you. Just one, one thing, if I could, uh, Mayor. Uh, uh, Ms. Went, just a, a, a thought that, that I had. Uh, in that that uh, July 5th may be a holiday for some people and they may not be in their regular schedule routine or whatever. Uh, I would certainly uh, be supportive if you decided to get creative with July 5th and make it a fun day with all kinds of different things happening that day versus well, a lap swim's got to start at this time or whatever. Um, feel free to make July 5th a an absolute time of celebration. This community has been very patient with us and is very excited. Um, but on the other hand, if you just want to open it up, feel free, but don't, don't, don't hesitate to, to make it a fun day. If, if, if um, you and the staff think that that would be uh, uh, not too much work. I think it's going to be a celebration day all day long as people come in. I'm not going to take away any lap swims, though, because our patients oh, who lap swim, it is going to be a celebration for them just to get in and do a couple really good laps. So I, I think we're going to have fun down there. I think we're going to play a lot of good music and we'll have some fun recreation time. But I'm excited for our lap swim and our aerobics and exercise groups who use it for wellness and physical therapy just to get in the water. So yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> Excellent. What a great opportunity. After over a year, we're getting our pool open. So I'm excited. All right. With that, let's move on to our final agenda item, which is our energy efficiency project development agreement. All right. Thank you, Mayor Greenell, members of the council. So we do have uh, Brian Labrie, and we also have 
uh, a few other members from the Johns Controls uh, team as well here, uh, Peter White, Tim Clark, to, uh, to help answer questions. But this is one of those projects that you mentioned that, uh, that has been some time uh, coming. Uh, I believe we have worked on this for over two years now. Uh, and, and it's not one of those projects that, that we took lightly as staff or that really, you know, and to give Johns Controls a, a ton of credit, they have spent countless hours in meetings with us over, over this time period. It was uh, Mayor Pro Tem Enscore that first brought this to our attention years ago and said, what about this opportunity? And, and that's where we started working with, with Brian and they brought their team in. There was a, a very competitive RFP to select Johnson Controls as the energy uh, service uh, contractor that could provide a contract uh, like this to us or an opportunity like this. They crawled all over the city, every city facility, wastewater treatment plant, pool, cultural center, street lights, I mean, you, you name it, they looked at it. Uh, they came back to the council, as you might remember, with several projects that were that were included as possibilities, uh, including possibly City Hall was even talked about at that time, and it was over $7 million in, in which we were looking at. Council then authorized us to bring Urban Futures on board. Urban Futures had a two-part contract. One, help us evaluate these projects with Johnson Controls, and then also two, help us in a second phase, make sure that we can get the financing and actually secure financing for these types of projects. Well, we're back with tonight, and I'll let, uh, I'll let Brian present all the details, are really two projects that we feel would best benefit the city and are best to move forward with at this time. Uh, there's one in the pool or a general fund project, like we were just talking about. How are, the, how are there different ways to try to make the pool more efficient? Well, this is one of them, and that's looking at the energy costs, looking at some of those components that we can do. The other is partnerships that, that we talked about, with, like the healthcare district. So that was an area we wanted to focus on. There is a project that staff's recommending there. And then the other is in our water system. And this is, again, it's a project uh, that the council has, uh, we've talked about as staff. We feel this is a very efficient way uh, to get it done from a, uh, from a construction standpoint. There's a lot of benefit with going with Johns Controls on something like this. And then well, possibly just as important as the impact to our customers. By getting this project done in a very efficient manner, manner and, and staying with a tight schedule, that'll be the least amount of impact on our, on our customers. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. He can walk you through some of the, the, the nuances, kind of the bones of the project. Their team's available for, uh, for questions, comments, in regard to any of those details. And then we can bring it back and we can talk about the actions that we need and why we need those actions. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Mayor. Oh. Thank you, Mary Greeno and members of the council. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to have us present this evening. And I'm very excited to be able to present the details of the project. As, as Eric had said, this has been years in the making. We're actually just about two months away from having it be our three year anniversary from when we first started talking about uh, these projects. And as uh, as Eric had said, we've done our preliminary evaluation and want to present what uh, we propose moving forward. So kind of going back to the goals of this project and how it aligns with some of the city's needs. This was a, a project that was proposed to address aging city infrastructure while also being fiscally responsible. Uh, the goal was to create a, a self-funding project, primarily focused around when we talk about self-funding, focused around the, the general fund project, the pool. And this, this does align with the strategic plan uh, in a couple of ways as addressing efficient and adequate infrastructure and also uh, creating efficiencies and adding value without compromising safety and performance. Now this project has, uh, has, has and has had multiple phases. The first after the RFQ process was initiated in selection. We went through something called a feasibility study where we went and identified, we did an analysis of city facilities to identify one if a project was feasible and what we think that project could look like. And now this is still without detailed engineering. So the next step would have been to go and really fine tune what our initial findings were and be able to come back to the city with what the final project would look like. Now we put together an interim stage to be working with this to work with the city's financial advisor, Urban Futures. That has also been complete. 
working through with them to fine tune the financials of the project. Although we were at a very preliminary stage, we were able to work with them uh, and find uh, a, a way to be able to move forward with a project that is gonna be highly beneficial to the city. And now we are at uh, the turning point for what would be our phase two, which is project development, where we take the project that we had initially identified and take you from uh, that stage all the way until uh, all the way to an executable construction contract. So we fully develop the project scope and we will be putting in a significant amount of engineering resources to be able to get the city to that point. At the end of the project development stage, we would be the initiation of a construction contract. If the city decides at that point in time to not enter into a construction contract, then there would be a breakage fee, which I'll go into a little bit of detail at a later point in time. But to move into this initial, to move into this project development phase, there is not an upfront cost to the city. And again, we'll be delivering a construction contract as a deliverable of this phase, leveraging energy and water and operational efficiency savings. Now, a part of that construction contract, there will be a guaranteed not to exceed price. This protects the city from price increases during construction and unwarranted change orders that can balloon construction prices as probably seen in the past. Now the third phase will be after executing the construction contract, moving forward and, and building the project. Now, when we've talked about the project self-funding as components like the general fund where energy efficiency savings would pay the debt service costs for the, the, the project itself, we will be offering services that will measure and verify those savings. Because if you're gonna be borrowing money and using a reduction in utility bills to pay the debt service for that money, wanna be able to have some security knowing that those savings are ultimately gonna be there. So that measurement and verification stage initiates after construction is complete. And I'll be able to go into detail a little bit later on about what that entails. So there are, as Eric had stated, there are two projects that are recommended to move forward into development, one of which being the, uh, the general fund. The, at the general fund, we are looking at the pool as the main site for the project, focusing on a, a heat pump, or sorry, a water heater electrification measure, which is switching the pool's propane boiler over to an electric heat pump. This has a variety of benefits one being that it's replacing aged equipment. Two, it is switching from a very expensive heating source, being that your propane is, is a lot more expensive than your electric, uh, electric rates. Being able to move over and switch fuel sources has a lot of financial benefits uh, to the city, as well then adding solar PV electrical generation to that facility to be able to offset the pool's energy use, as well as now adding uh, electric use for that heater as well. For the water fund, looking at the water, uh, water meter replacement. Currently, the city uh, has manually read meters with an average life nearing 50 years old. And so every single month that your meters are read for billing purposes, you have to have a a technician walking and driving across the city and manually reading all the data and that's a timely process. And, and the, the time that's required to do that is very valuable to the city and, can, and the city can benefit from being able to have that, that time be allocated elsewhere. So the, the proposed project is switching those aged manually read meters to new meters that are read uh, remotely with a, a remote radio system. So somebody would have a a component in their car or a truck that drives by and is able to collect data on a monthly basis, which drastically reduces the amount of time that's required to collect billing data. The wastewater fund, uh, there are no immediate projects recommended at this time. Through our evaluation, through working with Urban Futures and conversations with the city, the potential projects uh, were not of interest to be able to move forward for a variety of reasons. To give a little bit of detail for the general fund, the estimated project budget is approximately $480,000. The 
energy savings in, in the first year that is from non, non-solar generation. So this is mainly savings, uh, energy efficiency savings, as well as the, the fuel savings from propane to electricity is about $32,000. The annual solar electricity generation savings is approximately $5,000. Now you can see that there's an asterisk next to a few of these items, which means that they, they escalate at 3% per year. This is a project that's looked at as a, a 20 year term. So each year those numbers, both the savings as well as some costs are escalated at, at a 3% rate. The measurement and verification cost is $4,900 and that's for an eight year period. So the, the way that this is structured that's being proposed this time is we enter into the measurement and verification period post construction and Johnson Controls will measure and verify the savings annually for an eight year period. We'll make sure that the savings that is being proposed is realized by the city in the event of a shortfall. So that means in the event that the city is not realizing the savings that was being guaranteed in the project, because this didn't cover this earlier, but the, these savings are guaranteed by Johnson Controls. In the event that there is a shortfall, we'll take the, the cumulative savings over an eight year period. And if there is a shortfall, take that and extrapolate that over the 20 year term of the project and actually write the city a check for any, any shortfalls. As well, if there are any things that are going wrong, we'll be able to, to realize that through the measurement and verification period and, and write anything that uh, could have been, uh, if there was any failures or reasons that there were shortfall, we can have it addressed. We have built into the project an estimated O&M cost. So operation and maintenance cost with some of the measures that we're implementing of $2,000. So this is not something that the city is paying to Johnson Controls, but we estimate that some of the new equipment is going to have, have costs to be able to maintain properly. And so as a part of the money that you would potentially be borrowing, I uh, wanted to make sure that any costs related to managing that equipment are accounted for. The estimated level debt service payment, and this is obviously, a, it could be in flux due to the actual method of financing and rate at the time, but estimated a $33,000 debt service payment. So if you take the, the total savings for a 20 year term, compare that to the total debt service payments, there's an estimate at this time of a $228,000 positive cash flow across the 20 year finance term. And so this is being calculated at a rate of 3.38% right now and a 20 year term. These are numbers and figures that are being given to us by Urban Futures to calculate the potential project. So if there's any change in that rate for the better, that improves the overall cash flow. And speaking of that, if the city intends to uh, look into alternative financing mechanisms, considering that this is relatively not the, the largest project, the city looks into alternative financing and, and borrows internally, so that is it would have no cost of money. Then the cumulative positive cash flow over that 20 year term would actually be around $416,000. So the structure for the contract of the general fund project and procurement would be a design build energy savings performance contract. So Johnson Controls is a design build entity. We'll be able to take the city all the way from our preliminary design phases all the way through construction. And then a, the energy savings performance contract piece is us structuring a project so that way the savings funds the cost of the project and Johnson Controls guarantees that energy savings. Now the, there is a guaranteed max price construction cost and the procurement mechanism is going to be utilizing California Government Code 4217 ETSEC. Now this is a government code that is acted by the state of California to allow for projects that are in the best interest of the city due to the fact that their costs are generated by the, save, the, the savings, sorry, yeah, the cost of the projects are generated by the savings 
that are brought forward by the project. If the project pays for itself, the city can move into a sole source project utilizing this procurement code. So the project must pay for itself utilizing the savings it generates. And as stated, the project performance will be backed by Johnson Controls Savings Guarantee. Moving over to the water fund. So the estimated project budget is approximately $2 million. The operational savings, the operational efficiency savings that this project will generate is approximately $73,000. Now where this, there's a little bit of a nuance in operational savings. So operational savings isn't, necess isn't necessarily something that the city can use to uh, pay a bill or a debt service payment. These are man hours that are currently being utilized by city staff members to go and perform work that by implementing this project, those man hours can be utilized elsewhere. Now the, save, the city could decide to reallocate a, a, the, the staff member or they could look to not have a, a certain, not have a member employed to say have actual dollar savings. But as we all know, uh, good staff is hard to find and there are always greater needs than there are available resources. So most of the time city staff tends to reallocate that person elsewhere, but there is a monetary value to that. So the $73,000 is the reduction in man hours that is generated from not having to have someone manually read meters every single month, as well as some savings from new equipment compared to aged equipment. The annual water efficiency savings is $37,000. And this is a 3% increase in accuracy for the new water meters compared to the aged meters. And we're utilizing that the 3% testing that was done from the supplier that the city has used for replacing some meters already. The estimated level debt payment is approximately $140,000. Now the total benefits across a 20 year term of this project are $2,709,000. So the comparing the total debt service payments to the total benefits of the project, there is a net impact of $74,000. So by doing this project all at once, the city is able to generate almost the total value of the project in, its, in the savings that it generates both through water efficiency, as well as operational savings across that 20 year term. And again, as this asterisk represents over annual operational savings, this is escalated at a 3% a rate per year. Some details for the contract and the procurement of the water fund project, they're a little bit different than the general fund project. So this is a, it's still a design build energy savings performance contract, but the nuance in this is rather than having a performance guarantee with measurement and verification from Johnson Controls, because there are some costs associated with that, uh, the city's working together with the city and Urban Futures, the recommendation is using stipulated savings for the energy efficiency or the water efficiency improvements compared to guaranteed savings, knowing that there's already been testing done on these meters, shows that there's gonna be approximately a 3% increase. So rather than having to pay us to do additional testing and then even more testing afterwards to guarantee that that 3% is being realized, it would be in the best interest to use that 3% that's already been tested and stipulate the savings uh, for this contract. So it would be a, still be a energy savings performance contract but void of a guarantee and void of any measurement and verification costs and services. There'll still be a guaranteed max price construction cost. And the procurement mechanism would be utilizing source well, because as, as I just stated on the last slide, there's a net impact to the project of approximately $74,000. So the project does not fully pay for itself. So it doesn't fit the same mold as the other project. So this is going to be, SourceWell is a, co is a cooperative purchasing organization. So it will be utilizing the Joint Powers Act, California Government Code 6502, able to be, a, that allows the city to be able to almost piggyback on some pre-bid cooperative purchasing agreements that other agencies have enacted. 
So this does require the city to become a member, but it's free, it's free for the city to join. And then the city can actually utilize SourceWell for any other projects, any other materials that the city would be looking to procure in a way that is expedited and purchased. And again, they're leveraging pre-bid contracts for these goods and services. To go over some of the modeled financials, the escalation rate that we're using for utility costs. So when we're looking at some of these, these savings and how much the project is going to generate over time, when it comes to the financial benefits, we're, es we're escalating the utility rate increases at 3% per year. Now we've gone through our analysis with Urban Futures and, and we believe that this is uh, relatively conservative for the, the city and its historic electric prices. The solar panel degradation rate is half a percent. So what that number is, is looking at the overall generation of a solar panel over time, it's not gonna stay static. Eventually it's gonna slightly decrease per year. And that rate is at a half a percent. The finance term that we're looking at is 20 years. And ultimately that's subject to uh, the final financing, but as of right now, that's the rate in the term that we're using. And, and that rate is 3.38% for that 20 year term. We're not currently escalating the water meter efficiency savings because as the city has not gone through regular meter in, uh, regular rate increases in the past, we did not want to use a rate that did not align with the, the city's current uh, rate uh, water prices. And the O&M savings escalation is uh, 3% to align with inflation, as well as the O&M costs. So the costs that we're building into the project for the city to be able to have maintenance performed for the, for the assets is also escalated at 3% per year. So a little bit of details regarding the agreement that outlines our steps moving forward. So this is called the project development agreement. So if the project construction is initiated, all actual development costs are, are rolled into the overall project costs and are financed. The, as stated before, if the city decides when we get to this final stage and present the city with a construction contract, if you decide to not move forward for whatever reason, and we have delivered on all of our promises, the, the city would owe Johnson Controls a breakage fee, which allows us to recoup the costs that we've incurred to date in order to develop a successful project. So we've taken this and separated into two different agreements, one for the general fund and one for the water fund. So the, the general fund, the city does not move forward into construction. So if the city executes the project development agreement, does not enter into the construction contract, the breakage fee would be $69,000. Now there is a piece for risk mitigation for the city that is built into that. And as a part of that, in order for the city to have to pay Johnson Controls the $69,000 breakage fee, we have to deliver on our promise to, egg, to provide the city with a self-funded project. If Johnson Controls does not deliver a self-funded project at the end of the project development phase, then the city is not bound to Johnson Controls and you do not have to pay us that 69,000. It only comes into effect if we deliver on our promises, a successful project and then city decides to not move forward. For the water fund, there is a breakage fee of $73,000. So if the city does not move forward into construction after executing the project development agreement, then the breakage fee is 73,000. There's one piece that we do need to discuss a little bit, and that's the this note at the bottom. So if only the water fund project development agreement is executed. So tonight, if when you go to vote, if the general fund project is, is not executed for project development agreement and the water fund is only uh, voted to move forward, then the breakage fee for the water fund would adjust to $100,000. In the event of the opposite scenario and only the general fund project moving forward, then the breakage fee is still the 69,000.
It's going over a general timeline for the project. The timeline for project, the project development is phase is estimated from uh, July 21st, so starting tonight through September of 2021. During this project development phase, we'll be going through detailed site audits to complement the data and information that we've already gathered to date, and then be able to take that into uh, final development. Throughout this process, we'll be going through a variety of workshops, one of which being baseline, where we kind of where we go over the, pro the city's existing situation for energy costs and facility uh, condition, going over scope as well as measures. And this is one that we've talked with uh, city staff to be a, a, a large importance because one of the, the biggest component of the water meter project is what specific water meters are going to be selected. So during this measures and scope workshop, we're gonna be working closely with city, city staff to identify the best meter for uh, the city's needs and goals. Johnson Controls is non-proprietary for meter, meter type. So any, any meter that works best for the city's goals will ultimately be the one that uh, is selected for the overall project. A, met, a workshop to go over measurement and verification. This is where we will go into detail on the, the options that the city has for the measurement and verification process and ultimately make sure that everyone is is well informed on the, the process that we will be utilizing moving forward as well as a workshop to go over construction details and and financing and that will be in conjunction with the city's financial advisor again included in that is the uh, energy savings calculations and cost estimating and fine tuning that is right now we're at, we're still at a preliminary level going through financial modeling and the overall business case, and then developing that guarantee not to exceed construction contract with guarantee documents. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions from members of the council. Right. Thank you very much for your presentation, Brian. Do we have any questions from the council? Council member Altman. So Brian, is solar really a good fit up here with all of the, uh, I mean, we're socked in and we have, you know, we're socked in with fog, then we have cloud cover and then rain about three quarters of the year. It, I mean, how, how does that increase 3% a year with our current weather patterns? So the three percent, so I'll kind of take this in two, in two, uh, Stages and thank you, thank you for the question. The the, co the component of the three percent per year is it doesn't have to do with the current weather patterns. It it has to do specifically with the cost of electricity increasing per year. So just as you would increase your budgets at your various city facilities due to increases in utility costs, it's increasing the the value of your energy savings per year at three percent, which Generally, we'll see anywhere from three to five, six, seven percent in other areas of the state. Whereas in Pacific Power, you're likely to. We think that the most um, realistic rate is about three percent. So that is not on the on the weather pattern side, and more on the actual cost of of energy. Now, generate utilizing solar in your area is a challenge. It's part of the reason why there's only one site that we're looking at for solar generation. The, the pool has a higher electric rate compared to other areas of the city and the way that the building is structured, the cost to uh, construct a solar array is less than, for example, if we were put to, to put in a ground mounted system at other areas. And now we did to look into historic weather patterns and compare that to the interval data, basically how much energy the city uses at a specific time for that pool facility and, and believe that Solar is a could is a viable measure for that facility based off the data that's available. Right. Are we just allowed to ask questions, Fire at Will, or what? Go for it. Um, so, switching the pool from from gas to electric for heating the pool. Um, so we have a power outage. We we have some pretty gnarly winters here. Pretty bad winters. Sometimes we have a while, but heating that pool so the power goes out to the pool, we're on electric only. 
uh, isn't that going to draw more power reheat in that pool every time the power goes out? There, there is going to be that factor in play. Um, Pete, I see that you're coming off of mute. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, but uh, there, there would be that that component that when in a power outage, if that if that were to happen, then uh, the pool heating would go down and would not be able to to come back up until that facility is is energized again. Um, and there's there's some yep. nuances to it with the, with the existing system. So it's a it's a boiler type system, and so it does have a circulation pump uh, with it as well that runs off of electric. So even right now, if we lose power, we can't circulate that hot water into the pool to keep that pool heated. Uh, same with the building. You know, it goes through this boiler system, then it goes up to air handler units, which then push it out with fans. We lose the power. We don't have the fans. So so. If we lose power, we lose heating uh, that facility anyway. Okay, but uh, we're still doing it with with both electric and gas right now, right? Correct. Yeah. So the, the so unit like totally switching and taking gas off the table. Um, would it be harder to reheat with without the gas? And we'd have to look at the BTUs of the units that they're proposing as far as how much you know heat you could push into it to try to heat it up faster but if you were to lose power you still couldn't heat the pool or the building whether it's the old system or the new system okay well i have one more question so it's obvious that our voters love our pool right they they voted to have it open immediately they're willing to pay for it to be open so how long how long will the pool be down if this were to happen we have one of our engineers online that would be suited to answer this question. Tim, can you add a little bit of context to that? Sure, Council Member Smith. I believe that we would do the pool retrofit in such a manner that the switchover from one system to the other would be a minimal um, downtime. And we'd schedule that for maybe a weekend or a, set, a Sunday when the, when the pool's closed. So, I'm not thinking that you're gonna experience um, any significant downtime as, a, as, as this project's implemented. So the, the council respect, that is an excellent question. So, so Tim, just to clarify, you're thinking a couple of days. For the switchover. In, in which we, we, yeah. In which we'd yeah. have to actually close the facility and impact our pool patrons. Yeah, or we just don't heat the pool or circulate it. Uh, but uh, that's for the switch over the construction we can do while the building and the pool is occupied and in use. Thank you. Certainly. Right. Any further questions or comments from the council? So there's not any for John's controls. A couple of things just to sort of clarify. I know there's a lot of information that, that Brian just you know threw at you on the on the various projects with the, you know one being for the pool and then the water system. We also have the urban futures piece of it. So there there are several actions. You know the 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 two PDAs that we talked about and Brian explained those well. Those are the project development agreements, in which we have the breakage fees and all those different components that he spoke of. The third action is in regard to source well. So if you do move forward, we do need to join source well, right? It's not, there's not a, a huge commitment there. It's a free service, one that we might utilize in other areas as well. And then the fourth is to move forward with urban futures as well. So the financing of these projects are, are, is another component the council needs to be aware of. You have a pool project in the general fund for what's estimated at $480,000. There's several, several ways to fund this piece of it. You could look at a debt service or taking out a loan to do it as Brian presented with the 3.38% 20 years, right? Self-funding, that's, that's great, but we have other projects we need to think about as a city as well. Council has uh, had an interest or an appetite to fund City Hall. Uh, we have the police department we're talking about. We have Beachfront Park in that $8.5 million grant application and which will probably have some sort of cash, uh, cash flow uh, type issues in which we might have to take out a bridge loan. We also have Pebble Beach. So taking a, a project and going out for debt service in the general fund will have some impacts on whether we can go and get another debt service when those projects are ready to be funded. 
the timing of this project is going to be quicker than those other ones. Those other projects, you look at City Hall, you look at the PD, we have to get those projects designed. You're probably nine months out, somewhere in that time from a year out from actually needing that funding to start construction on those. Beachfront Park's kind of in that same piece where we have to get it designed and then we can start construction, which is really where we need the cash flow. So that's where having someone like Urban Futures to look at this and figure out the best way to fund it is appropriate. That's where Brian also showed the fact that if we can somehow self-fund this as the in the general fund, it's a smaller project, that would be possibly a better option. But again, urban futures will be uh, would be needed uh, to to analyze that work. Uh, the other piece of urban futures is trying to find a, a way to fund the water project. Water project uh, to replace the meters is estimated at two million dollars. When we looked at this as a staff, this seems like a a very efficient way to, uh, to complete this project. Johnson Control has a lot of experience doing it. They have actually come well under the estimated cost of this project, which uh, an engineering firm gave us about five years ago. So to have that scenario play out in today's you know, atmosphere, uh, you know, construction costs going through the roof, this is an ideal time to do it. That being said, they want a 20% contingency on that project. So even though it's estimated at, at 2 million, the construction guarantee is really 2.4, still well below the approximate $5 million that the engineers gave us uh, five or six years ago to do it. So that's something to be aware of. Urban Futures though would have to help us analyze that. Uh, another thing that we don't ha quite have all the information on which could play out at just about the right timing for this project is the use of the rescue funds. We don't know exactly what they can be used for as far as economic development, um, different sort of general fund projects that they could be used for, but we know the city's going to get 1.6 million. We also know that they can be used for water and wastewater projects. That's pretty straightforward. So once we start to figure out the, the other components of what we can use that funding for, there might be a component that we use for a project like this that maybe is ready to go or to fund some of those other critical projects that are in the water system. So urban futures, will be needed uh, for the second phase of financing. Their cost for a private placement, if I remember right and looking back in the staff report, it's approximately $30,000 if I remember correctly for a private placement or to go to a bank and get a loan or to try to do a public placement or a bond, it's about 35,000, which would then be rolled into the financing of the project itself. So that is the, the last action that we're looking for from the council is to keep Urban Futures moving with this team to figure out how we actually fund the project. So once it's done, we're ready to go and we have a, a clear pathway to, uh, to completion. Okay. Any discussion concerning what we just, the, the fire hose that we just uh, had? I do apologize. That's our direction. Well, I, I would, um, this is something that, that, that uh, city manager Weir just alluded to. Um, I really think that number one, I'm supportive of both of these projects. Um, as far as the pool project, um, I, I would like to, I, I don't want to debt service the pool project. I think that there's a strategy to be able to do that and, and uh, uh, do, do it uh, funded internally. I believe that, that what we're going to discover with that, that fourth quarter measure S money is going to come in much higher than what we had initially anticipated. Um, I, I would recommend that anything above what we that came in that we've already spent um, could go directly to this. That could be that could be as much as seventy, eighty thousand dollars just in the fourth quarter of last year that, that we haven't accounted for. Uh, I think that that Measure S money is going to that uh, is going to come in much higher in this next fiscal year, um, which I think also provides uh, some some room to to do a self funded project, um, and, and maybe even the possibility of of, of re examining um, Measure S uh, as we look at what we're doing, um, because obviously the pool was a big. A, a big uh, a thing that our, our, our public uh, weighed in on, as, as Councilmember Smith said, and, and maybe we make of the pool a higher priority for Measure S in this first year to get this project done. Um, 
if, if there's money that do that so that we can um, uh, keep, give ourselves the, 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 the uh, uh, latitude to look at other debt services for other infrastructure uh, projects um, that, that, may, that may come to fruition. They may not, but I'd like to be able to have the, uh, the ability to do those without having um, tied our hands over $480,000 that we may be able to, to self-fund. Um, from the, 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 uh, the water project and the meter project, I, 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 have, I have tried to read every single uh, bulletin from every source regarding the, the American Rescue Act. Uh, I truly believe that, that this fits into the category of what they are allowing these dollars to be used for. Um, and, and I can't think of, uh, of a better way to, to make use of this, this money that we didn't anticipate, but that it is coming uh, than to, to make a huge upgrade into our water system that is going to, uh, that I, I just, I, again, I, I know that we've gone back and forth uh, as far as getting clear guidance the reality is, is, is um, in, in talking to other, other leaders and other municipalities, huh, the sort of the, the common uh, uh, theme that I'm hearing is, is we may never get clear guidance. We've got to move on with business. And um, my guess is, is if we spend the money, um, the reality is, is I, I don't think that this is going to come back against us if we can justify why we make the expense. Um, so... Uh, I think we have a good strategy uh, for both of these projects, uh, and I think there is a possibility that neither one of them necessarily have to incur a significant amount of debt uh, for the city, allowing us to have um, some, some opportunities to do some of the other things that we've talked about. So that's my input. All right. Boy, if if that was the case with uh, those Rescue Act funds, oh my goodness, so, yeah, that would be great. Um, but I, I guess the first step in uh, that is to study it with Urban Futures and and to see uh, see what opportunities arise. Um, I, I do believe that the pool project is is a really important project. The the infrastructure in that building is. Uh, aged, and so we uh, we're going to have to replace it anyway very shortly. Um, so I, I believe that uh, you got to strike when the iron's hot, and and I think that that project that's a good project. Uh, personally, I, I believe that we need to follow through with that one. Um, I'm a little iffy on the um, the solar part of it, but uh, that that project does have the, um, the guarantee uh, associated with it, the guaranteed savings. And so I think that that's a risk, uh, a, a reasonable risk, should I say. Um, I'd love to see that project get funded through our general fund if we could, or using Measure S funds. Um, I think that that's good, a good utilization of funds. Um, to increase the efficiency of that pool. Um, as far as the $2 million project for replacing the meters, um, that's a lot of money. I'd really get, like to get out of that, get it done without financing, but um, I know that that's probably not a reasonable expectation. Um, it, it is an important project as well because it, it will increase the efficiency um, by which we, we do our daily business with our water fund. So I think that that's also a very important project. Um, so I, I think that we should move forward with both of these as well. Um, and I think having urban futures uh, to look at the details of this is, is important as well. So um, that's where I'm at is the, the any any further discussion from the council? I have a question, Councilmember Altman. So, what is it that we're um, proposing to vote on this evening? 
So there are several actions from the council. So you have the, the project development agreements for both the, uh, the pool and the water system. Those are, those are kind of the drivers for the rest of the action. So project development agreement commits to a contract with Johns Controls that says we want you to move forward with the design basically of it or the, the full evaluation. So they're gonna get into design. They're gonna to get to the point that they can say, yes, we can guarantee that we can build this project for the amount stated. It's like in the pool, $480,000. And we're gonna guarantee that it is a self-funding project that, that you can go out, you can get your, your financing and that the savings will pay for the project itself. If they can do that, then it'll be another decision point for the city. It'll come back to the city council and the city council can say, yes, we want you to move forward with the project, in which case the project just continues to move forward. We would then need to find a way to fund the $480,000 project and we get a new heating system for the pool and solar on top. If the city at that point in time says, you know, there's some other things that we want to do. We understand that you have met your commitments that yes, this project would be self-funded, but we just don't want to move forward with it then we would need to pay John's control $69,000 for the time and effort that they put into it so far. They would then give us all of their documentation, all of their working drawings, everything to the point that they have. It's not gonna be construction ready, but we would I'm sure be to the point that we have equipment, uh, you know, models and have all these things sort of ready to go. So if we ever do want to implement this project, we wouldn't be starting from square one anymore. We'd be starting from the point where John's control said, we can guarantee this project. So that's on the that's on the pool side of things. And that's one PDA. So that's one action for the council to consider. The second action is the second PDA, project development agreement, and that's for the water system. Water system operates a little bit differently where it's a guaranteed max construction cost. And that's, they think it's gonna be 2 million, but they want a 20% contingency because there's roughly 4,000 meters out there. So they're, they're trying to design a project in which you're going to put a new meter in 4,000 different locations. There, there's, there's a lot of, of different things. They've made some assumptions in here, uh, but they want the extra 20%, which is understandable. 2.4 million. They are again going to go through the same process. They come back to us. They say, yes, we've gone through all the due diligence. We've looked at these. We're going to guarantee we can build it for the 2.4 million. We're going to use a cooperative purchasing uh, agreement. So it's not the self-funding project, but it is uh, a vetted situation that does meet our procurement process for, for this type of a project. And we have a guaranteed price to replace all of our meters. If the city at that point says, you know, we, again, we're, we're, we thank you for your time. But we're not interested in doing this. Then we would need to pay uh, Johnson controls 73,000, I believe, I think was the, uh, was the dollar amount on that one. Slight nuance there, if the, if the council tonight decides, you know, we're not interested in the pool at all and we're only moving forward with the water, then that breakage fee is 100000 But So that's that's basically what you're deciding tonight. The other actions before the council, join sor source well so we can move forward with the water system uh, and then also uh, authorize staff to move forward with the second phase in Urban Futures, which is our financial advisor to help us fund these projects. If the council chooses to not take action on those two PDAs, there's no reason to take action on the source well or, or urban futures either. Okay, I think I understand it in a, a simpler way, but I, I just wanted to uh, get the get straight the timeline. So this decision has to be made tonight, I guess, because I was I I, I I support both these projects. Don't get me wrong, but I would just like for once to vote for something we already have the money for instead of gambling and hoping that we get the money later somehow. And I know that we need our loan services for some possible very important grants coming up if we get them. And so, I, and I know we tabled this before because we didn't put it in the budget, correct? The, the 73 or the 69. And so it's not in the budget. So I was just wondering, is there any way we can table it for a quarter or two, or is this something we have to decide on right now? Do we have to spend all the money possible in 2021? Or is there a way that we can put some projects off for a little while till we at least get some more information on our revenue? 
because it seems to me like we're doing a lot of ifs, ands, or maybes. And, uh, and, and, and I, I'm not trying to say I don't support these projects. They sound very needed, especially the metering. I mean, you know, we need to get up to date on that. And uh, certainly would love to save energy. I, you know, it seems like Pacific Power would even want to come in on that. I know they support uh, clean energy programs, but, um, you know, you guys make me nervous sometimes with uh, talking about how we don't have the money and we're not going to borrow it. I want to, <laughs> what are we, we going to, where are we getting it? Because Mayor uh, Pro Tem in the score, you said we might have the resources internally to do this. Uh, maybe the pool project, yep. not, the, not the metering. And, and so could you give me more details on how we would uh, get the money? Well, uh, some of that's going to come from the fourth quarter of Measure S. I mean, it, 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 the uh, uh, H&L has already ident identified that our uh, uh, sales tax revenues are coming in significantly higher than what they projected. So if the regular sales tax is going to come in higher, so is, so, is measure, so is Measure S. It's all sales tax money. It's just so that those numbers are going to come in higher for the fourth quarter, that one quarter that we got when it started coming in in April. Um, and then obviously it's going to come in higher each quarter as, as we receive it. So uh, there's going to be money, you know, we, we talked before about the fact that we, in essence, we allocated all of Measure S, but that was based on what we thought Measure S would be conservatively, but I think it's going to be higher than that. Plus, I do, I do, you know, and I think that we can go back even with the Citizens Oversight Committee and, and re-look at some of our allocations and say, we have a, a, a real great opportunity to invest in the pool right now. We know this is important to our community. Maybe we need to do some of these things with this money this year instead of some of the other things that you have recommended. And, and uh, so I, I think that the I think that there is a, a possibility for for that money um, there in that case. As far as the the water meters, uh, I am supportive of a debt service, um, and I'm supportive of moving forward with this now, uh, regardless of the American Rescue Act. If the American Rescue Act comes through and we take it out a, a two million dollar debt service, and we then feel comfortable that we can drop a million onto it, we'll just pay down the debt. Um, uh, and, and the reason that I support moving now on the debt service is interest rates are already starting to climb. Um, and, and, and if we're going to, if we're going to take out a debt service, we don't want to wait much longer. I think urban futures will tell us that, that if you're going to do a debt service, you, you need to, you need to start making those plans. Now um, we're already seeing the, the, uh, the interest rates begin to climb. And when, when you're borrowing $2 million, you know, a half a percent interest, all of a sudden you're, you're, you're paying more money out that, that we wouldn't have to pay. So um, that, that's my rationale, uh, Council Member Altman, is, is uh, as far as the being able to self-fund the pool. And, and again, I, I am supportive of the, of the debt service uh, for, the, uh, for the water meter uh, project and moving forward because I don't want to pay any more interest than I have to. We have to. You know, and, and one other component for the pool project. So, so they're using rates that, that were given to them by our financial consultant, the 3.38 for 20 years. That comes with a, a certain level of debt service. Their savings that they're projecting pays for that debt service. So it's almost almost a wash uh, in the early years. I think it comes really close. And then in the later years, after we're done with the measurement and verification piece, we actually start making money to where this is a this project does sell fund. So the project that you're going to do pays for itself almost from the beginning and then does pay for itself in the later years. So there's not a huge cost on the pool side from just uh, being able to finance it because of the savings piece of it. Uh, the water fund's a little bit different, but that is a project we need to do anyway as a city. Our meters are 50 years old. We're going through a, a you know rate analysis right now. These are some of the things we need to do just as a responsible utility uh, and, and find a way to fund those. Uh, the, the other piece of it is construction costs right now are are going outrageous. Uh, yeah, they're 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 accelerating faster than the interest rates are. And you know, Brian being in the business, I'm sure could speak to it a little bit. 
So we're just we're just entering a uh, project development agreement at this time where the financial agreement uh, could be 69 or 73, correct? Yes, although the, the PDA does lock in some of these numbers that we're talking about tonight. So the 480, uh, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but the 480 uh, for the pool project does get locked uh, with the PDA and the 2 million plus 20%. So 2.4 million does get locked as well, I believe, correct? So the, not for the, the general fund. So right now the, the general fund is still a, it's a preliminary budget estimated at approximately 480. The binding factor for the general fund project is not the actual budgeted cost, but it's the fact that the project self funds. So that's the main binding component is that we have to deliver a project that pays for itself utilizing the savings that the project generates. The, the binding component that is for, is for the, the water fund when it comes to its budget that right now we propose a two point, a $2 million project with a 20% contingency. So that is a, looking at a, a, an estimated max price or a max price of 2.4 million. And so Brian, the pool project could come in at 520,000, but you would have to then match the savings in order for the, the city to be on the hook for what you're saying, Ray, is that 69,000? Correct. Uh, the city would then know a lot more when it's actually time to come and say, yes, we're moving forward with the construction piece of it. And that's when we'd be on the, you know, that's when we would be on the hook for that full construction cost after we had that. We choose to walk away. The max we're on the hook for would be 69,000 uh, and 73,000 general fund and water project. Correct. Mm. I see Pete, uh, Pete White has joined us uh, as well. Pete is the regional manager for Johns Controls. Uh, and uh, I could have got the title wrong, Pete, but feel free to correct me on that one. Uh, and I'm, it, no, no. 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 <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, have, great. I've been having a little time. You have your with, phone and your computer right, on, the, on the phone listening. So uh, just wanted to let you know that. Um, if, uh, what, what Brian said was was completely accurate in terms of of um, you know how the PDAs work. The um, the other thing though that that I think Eric and the team's done really well to date is to build in some conservatism in the rates themselves. So we're you know we we think actually that in the end uh, you'll you'll get even a better return on your investment with both of these projects just due to lower financing costs. So uh, I, I think. Um, Mayor Pro Tem had a, had a good point in terms of uh, wanting to move quickly on this because rates are increasing, but you do have conservatism built into your numbers now. So we feel pretty good about that. That'll help you out in the end. All right. Any further discussion? All right, with that, let's open up public comment at this time. Any public comment? I don't see any hands raised via Zoom. And no emails. All right, thank you. Coming back to the council, um, I will just say this. Just because we signed this contract doesn't mean the project's going through. It, it means that we're looking at the project uh, Johnson Controls going, is going to um, go in and come back with a project, actually two projects, and if if they fit with what they uh, propose, what will be their savings, then, then um, with a, the self-funding project, then we will um, be on the hook for that, 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 you know, breakage fee. And if, if they don't, then we don't have to pay it. Um, so I, I think this is a safe bet. I think that we should uh, go through with this. And um, I mean, we're going to have to replace these anyway, right? So um, this is a way that we can do that. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I was trying to be really conservative on this one, but you know, we would still be getting something for for our money, either either if we did it or we didn't do it. So that that's what that's uh, Council Member Altman. That's how I've been looking at it. Is is they're going to provide a product no matter what. So. All right. 
If there isn't any further discussion, I'll open up the floor for a motion. I guess just for clarification, um, do um, uh, Ms. Rice do do would you prefer that we we treat each of these uh, as individual actions since there are separate um, project development agreements with different uh, numbers associated with them? Or, or Sorry, is it okay just to do a, 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 trouble unmuting myself? Um, I would I would take the PDA separately just because there's there's a possibility that you don't approve both of them. Okay. You know, if there's a split vote. So all right. Then uh, Mayor, I would I would um I would make a motion that we authorize the city manager to sign a project development agreement with Johnson Controls. Incorporated to develop an energy service project for the Fred Ender pool. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second that. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Clerk, please pull the vote. Council Member Altman? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Inscore? Yes. And Mayor Greeno? Yes. I'll entertain the next motion. So Mayor. on the on the second motion, I'd say you could include the rest of the actions in in one motion. Okay, I, I'll do that, Mayor. Uh, I I would make a motion we authorize the city manager to sign a project development agreement with Johnson Controls Incorporated to develop an energy service project for the replacement upgrade of existing water meters with an automated meter reading uh, system and direct staff to become a member of Sourcewell, a pre-bid cooperative purchasing membership, and authorize uh, staff to proceed with phase two of the Urban Futures Agreement dated February 1st, 2021. All right, thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, please pull the vote. Yes, uh, Council Member Altman. Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Inscore? Yes. And Mayor Credo? Yes, thank you. All right, that was the final uh, item on our agenda for this evening. Moving on to council member items. Do we have any legislative items to discuss at this time? I, I just, just Brian and, and Peter, Tim, thank you. Before you guys go, appreciate it. Uh, right. <laughs> Appreciate your patience with us. We, we've put you through the ringer and you, you have stuck with us. Um, uh, probably the most conservative group of people who ask more questions than you probably will be asked in the next 10 years. But um, so I, I and, and Brian, for you and I, I mean, if we started talking about this four years ago, I believe, uh, maybe, maybe it was just more than four. So thank you. I just appreciate your patience. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and as well, thank you, Mayor and members of council. We're really looking forward to, to moving forward with this, and it, it, it's, it'll all be worth it in the end. We've really enjoyed working with y'all. If we didn't, I wouldn't be here tonight, yeah. and so we're, we're really looking forward to being able to put together a successful project for you, so thank you, and, and looking forward to doing more work with the city. All right. Thank you again. Thanks. Now, moving on to legislative items. Do we have any legislative items? The only thing I have, Mayor, came in late this evening, and I haven't had a chance to, to look at it. We may be talking about it tomorrow. It has to do with uh, SB 1383 and, and waste recovery, but I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So um, we'll, we'll look at it at solid waste first, maybe. <laughs> All right. Uh, city manager report at this time. you have anything for us, uh, Mr. Weir? Oh, just a uh, just a few things. So one wanted to uh, to confirm that uh, we will have a quorum for a special meeting this Thursday at 530 to hit a couple of pressing items uh, for the council. So I think I did receive uh, thumbs up from the majority of the council on that. I know, Mayor, you are uh, you are a maybe uh, on this one. 
Uh, I unfortunately have to work, so I, I will not be in attendance at that meeting. Okay. We, we do have some critical business though to take care of before the end of the of the fiscal year. Uh, do I have a thumbs up from the other council members then? You will be in attendance? Okay, excellent. We will, uh, we will get that scheduled. Uh, one of the other things I want to point out tonight is the notice of completion for Amador Tank uh, and just the partnership that, that we've had with Elk Valley. I mean, what a tremendous you know, partner community, uh, you know, uh, uh, asset that we have in, in Elk Valley Rancheria and the staff uh, and working with them. So they uh, you know, have done a great job on Amador Tank. That one's moving forward as well. And then one of the items that will be on the special meeting on Thursday is to submit the application for the, for the raise grant is what it's called now, but it's, it used to call the build grant before that it was Tiger. We'll talk about it in detail then, but again, another great partnership. We, we think that we have a real opportunity there with this year's uh, raise grant. And so, uh, so anyway, just wanted to, to highlight that fact on this agenda that that Amador project has been a great one and wouldn't have been able to be done uh, without that partnership. A couple of other things. Uh, the fire district, uh, Crest Fire Protection District, uh, did direct the, uh, the city clerk to do an official recount. So although the first count uh, of that ballot, it did fail by less than one vote, uh, the clerk recorder will be doing an official recount. That'll happen one week from today. So that one has a, a big relevance to our fire department and the, uh, and the implementation of our fire department master plan. So we'll be, uh, we'll be watching that one closely as it, like I say, came down to less than one vote. So that recount will be very important. Uh, another thing that staff will be implementing uh, very soon, as soon as possibly tomorrow or the next day, are radio ads in regard to the beach fire ordinance. Uh, signage will go out uh, as well. So we will get that up, try to get the public as much information as we can on that. I know Chief Gillespie has been working uh, on that uh, currently. So we'll get that out to the public to try to uh, try to inform everyone before the 4th of July, before they get set up on the beach. Uh, we'll inform them that there are other beaches that they can go to, South Beach, the other side of, you know, Howe Drive, uh, Pebble Beach, uh, north of the city limits. All those locations are, uh, are approved for fires. Just the, the new ordinance uh, prohibits uh, that location. I know that I did receive an email from Dr. Raywald uh, after, uh, after his presentation or the proclamation presentation was misstated slightly. And so, uh, so I wanted to just inform the public. Dr. Raywald actually started with the health department uh, two stints, one 2001, 2006, then it started again in 2013. He was only working though about 10 hours a week before the pandemic. And then that's when he really sort of uh, was, was pulled in to, uh, to the job that, that he did a tremendous job doing. Uh, he wanted me to, uh, to thank the council again for the, the presentation. Uh, they were all deeply honored according to Dr. Raywald. So it's a, a very good thing. A couple projects moving forward for us. Generator at the PD. The, uh, the pad was poured recently. They're going to set that generator, I believe, this week. Uh, same with the rainy collector. They're going to uh, be installing the new pumps for the rainy collector. So that's going to be done before June 30th as well. So lots of, uh, lots of work going on there. And then also just wanted to, uh, to highlight uh, our chief of police. He was uh, nominated as one of our hometown heroes. And so congratulations to, uh, to Chief Griffin. Uh, I was also nominated, so I'll humbly uh, accept that. But Chief Griffin did a, uh, has done a great job. The community uh, certainly supports uh, the job that our officers are doing and it's highlighted by that honor. What is it? All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, moving on to the council, actually. Uh, council Member Altman, do you have anything to report out? No, I don't. Mayor, I believe City Attorney Rice did have one thing that I must possibly uh, missed. Uh, oh, okay. We were going to um, discuss availability for another special meeting for labor negotiations. Uh, yeah. So we have we have a special meeting scheduled five thirty on Thursday. Uh, we could. It's going to be a fairly short agenda. We could plan on trying to meet after that, if that works for the council. Of course, uh, Mayor Greeno is not going to be able to make that. Um, and right. really, this is a fairly important closed session uh, to have all council members there. No, uh, the 24th will not work for me. But the we could do it on, we could look at Friday 
uh, Friday evening. It's not ideal, I know. Um, I won't be available either. Not, not on Friday either. Saturday morning. Um, what about Monday the 28th? Monday the 20th, I'm going to be out of town next week is the only the only issue. I could try to join you guys via Zoom, but I think we, we wanted everyone there sort of in person. I know we're looking at canceling the July 6th meeting. We could we could as a group meet and and just do a closed session on July 6th. It, it was our was our was our goal to have something obviously before the end of the fiscal year? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know how we do that now. We just approved the budget, but. Uh, I, I don't think in this case, I mean, the, the, the item that's going to be on closed session is going to be labor negotiation. So it's going to take, uh, you know, a recommendation from the council and then to go back to all the associations. And so we're, we're a little ways away. Um, it would probably go retroactive back to July 1st. Uh, with any decisions that were made. Uh, but again, that's, uh, that is up for uh, council discussion. Well, if, if we're gonna cancel on the 6th, I think that we should move it further out then. Um, what about Thursday the 8th? Yeah, I, I know for me, any, any night that week, would I would be available? Okay. Okay. What about the rest of the council, uh, Councilmember Wright? You available on the eighth? But one second, just look on my screen. All right. Um, that should be fine. Okay. Councilmember Altman. Are you available on the 8th, Councilmember Altman? Yeah, that's good for me. Okay. Councilmember Smith? Uh, I'm going to say yeah right now. All right. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, yeah, that's kind of far out for me to say, for me to say no. Never know what'll happen. All right. Mayor Pro Tem, are you are yeah, you yeah the eighth is good. If we go any further than that, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be out of town. So okay. um, we we we, it, we that's that's about the limit. And then I'm gonna be gone for um, a week and a half or so, which will push me all the way towards the end of of July. So the eighth works for me. Okay, great. Looks like we have everyone for you then, Mr. Weir. Excellent. I do. I do appreciate that, and appreciate the reminder from City Attorney Rice to get that scheduled. All right. Moving back to Council uh, members reporting out. Council Member Wright, do you have anything for us? Nothing for me. All right. Council Member Smith. No, oh, nothing. All right. Mayor Pro Tem Inscor, do you have anything for us? Tonight? Yep. The only thing is, is uh, uh, just to, as a maybe a public <laughs> reminder, and uh, as well as a. Just an encouragement to the council um, is that that Fourth of July is happening. <laughs> All the events are happening. The parade is happening. Um, the water ball competition with the fire department's happening. Everything's happening, and and I think that that um, this community is is ready for something to happen, and and I, I'm very excited about it. Um, I'm excited to to be down there at the podium announcing the parade, uh, which I've done for the last several years and, and uh, hope that, uh, that given the fact that the uh, Olympics are right around the corner, I'm hoping that the, the city float is still planning on, uh, on being a part of the, the they, nobody tore that thing apart from a couple of years ago. Um, Mr. Weir, I'm, I'm hoping that the, the city is gonna uh, have a float in the parade. And, and uh, so anyway, just looking forward to it. Uh, I think it's going to be, uh, I, I just think that we're going to have, it, it, man, we have needed to get out and, and enjoy. I, I know on a limited scale what that first Friday felt like. It actually felt like our world was coming back a little bit um, to normal. Um, and um, so 
And the, the, the other thing I just want to point out, and I know Mr. Weir has made, a, uh, has made reference to it, uh, but, but our city is packed with guests and people, and, and we should be very thankful. Um, we, are, we are reaping the benefits of, of, of people who are, who are traveling in-state and want to be in rural areas. And uh, I'm, again, I'm so very thankful that, that our Visitor Bureau continued to market our area through the pandemic because our hotels are all full and that's a good thing for all of us. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank cannot you. Guarantee, cannot guarantee we will have a city float in the parade. We did discuss it. Fourth is a very busy day, obviously for us with, with barricades and everything else. And so, you know, you're going to have your fire trucks, I have your police cars. City Hall, though, will be entered. It will be entered in the decorating contest, and so you very well might see some of those same things, not on a float, but at City Hall, proudly displayed uh, for the Fourth of July. In which well, we hook that thing up behind one of the fire engines. Maybe <laughs> Councilmember Smith could uh, could make that one happen. Yeah, <laughs> I want those rings. I want them on fire. Something. <laughs> Uh, I think I think I'm gonna watch the parade this year. I, <laughs> I haven't watched a parade. It's, I don't think my daughter's even ever seen a parade. Uh, good for you. I've always been in it. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll close it out with. Um, I'm so thankful that we're coming to the end of this pandemic, and uh, that we as a people can come out and enjoy the our Independence Day together and start to have somewhat of a some norm uh, a bit of normalcy back in our lives with some of these events coming up here on uh, Independence Day. Um, people, they, they flooded here, not because of our government. They, they flooded here because not because of, you know, regulatory structures or low, low taxes, which you know, I'm sure that they were low at the time because there really wasn't much government at the time, but they, they flooded here because of, of liberty and they continue to flood here because of, of the freedoms that we enjoy and the opportunity that, that comes from that. And so I'm, I'm really thankful for, um, for everybody on the council and, and for all the hard work that our staff does. And um, I'm thankful for our great country that we live in and the people who sacrifice every single day to, to keep that uh, country running efficiently and, and keeping our, our people safe here. Um, so with that, I, I, I will uh, just say, I hope that everybody has a safe 4th of July. Please be careful. Uh, don't be too much of a fire bug. Uh, enjoy yourself, but be safe. And uh, with that, I'll sign off. Thank you and I'll call this meeting adjourned. And our next meeting will be on June 24th, which is uh, going to be a special meeting at 5.30. Good night, everybody.